The uh, subcommittee will come to order, and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for being here uh, for this very important hearing um, on global persecution of Christians. I just would note parenthetically that I chaired my first hearing when I became chairman of the Human Rights Committee back in the mid-1990s when we recognized that there was an explosion of persecution, harassment, and discrimination against Christians occurring worldwide. And so from since 1995 and today, almost 20 years, uh, it has gone from bad to extraordinarily worse. So that's why we're having this hearing. I would also note to my colleagues uh, that we've had many country-specific hearings over the years uh, and over the last several months, including one on Syria, three on the Coptic Christians, and some regional hearings, but this one is to look at the global reach. There is a dangerous, and I would suggest a, a frightening phenomenon occurring globally uh, in the persecution of Christians. Today's focus on anti-Christian persecution is not meant to minimize the suffering of other religious minorities who are imprisoned or killed uh, for their beliefs. As the poet John Donne once wrote, any man's death doth diminish me. We stand for human dignity and respect for life from the womb to tomb, and this subcommittee has and will continue to highlight the sufferings of religious minorities around the globe, be they Ahmadi Muslims in Pakistan, Baha'i in Iran, Buddhists in occupied Tibet, Yazidis in Iraq, or Muslim Rohingyas in people in Burma. Christians, however, remain the most persecuted religious group in the world over and thus deserve the special attention that today's hearing will provide them. As one of today's witnesses, the distinguished journalist John Allen has written, and I quote him, Christians today indisputably are the most persecuted religious body on the planet, and too often their martyrs suffer in silence. Researchers from the Pew Center have documented incidents of harassment of religious groups worldwide, a term defined as including, quote, physical assaults, arrests and detentions, desecration of holy sites, and discrimination against religious groups in employment, education, and housing. And that's, it has concluded that Christians are the single most harassed group today. In the year 2012, Pew reports, Christians were harassed, were, were harassed in 110 countries around the world. This is particularly true in the Middle East, where one of those we will hear from today, Archbishop Francis Chulakot, has said, and I quote him, flagrant and widespread persecutions of Christians rages even as we meet. Archbishop Chulaka was the papal nuncio to Iraq, where he has seen repeated violent assaults on Christians, such as the October 31, 2010 assault upon Our Lady of Deliverance Syrian Catholic Church in Baghdad, in which 58 people were killed and another 70 were wounded. Attacks such as this have led the Christian population of Iraq, whose roots date back to the time of the apostles, to dwindle from 1.4 million in 1987, prior to the first Gulf War, to as little as 150,000 today, according to some estimates. Much of this exodus has occurred during a time in which our country invested heavily in blood and treasure in seeking to help Iraqis build a democracy. As we witness the black flag of Al-Qaeda again flying over cities such as Fallujah, which we had won at the cost of so much American blood, we wonder how it is that for Christians in Iraq, life appears to be worse now than it was under the vicious dictator Saddam Hussein. If we turn to Egypt, we see a Christian population which dates back to the apostle St. Mark also being oppressed. At a hearing we held on December 10th, Human Rights Day, we heard how churches had been subjected to mob attacks and burned. For example, in April of 2012, St. Mark's Cathedral, seat of the Coptic Pope, was attacked by 30 to 40 Muslim youths. While dozens of cops were sheltering inside, security forces joined, didn't stop, joined the mob. Rather than dispensing the crowd, they participated in the all-night attack or stood idly by as rocks, gasoline bombs, and gas canisters were lobbied, lobbed, I should say, into the iconic cathedral. I call your attention to the photographs of churches in Egypt to illustrate the outrages perpetrated against Christians simply for being Christian. Likewise, last year, this subcommittee held a hearing on the persecution of religious minorities in Syria. 
Syria has been a place of relative tolerance for religious minorities in the Middle East, including groups like the Mandian, Mandians, who trace their roots to the time of St. John the Baptist, with whom they still revere. It is in this connection with the past which has helped bring radical, radical Islamists to Syria, where not only do they seek to overthrow the violent dictator Bashar al-Assad, but also seek to eradicate Christianity from the land. I would note parenthetically that when asked, our panel of NGO witnesses said to a group that what's happening in Iraq constitutes a genocide against Christians. Last September, members of the Al Nursa, Nursa an Al-Qaeda-linked group, attacked the town of Malua. Why, why is this significant? It's because Malua a, is a living link with the time of Christ, a Christian village in Syria where Aramaic, the language of Jesus, is still spoken. It is for this reason that Malua has been targeted, in the words of one of those attacking this small village, whose way of life had remained largely unchanged over the centuries, the Muhajideen are seeking to, quote, conquer, this is their quote, the capital of the Crusaders. Such is the perspective of one whose vision has been distorted by hatred. But it is not just in the Middle East where we see the persecution of Christians. I would like to recall one story of one man that I met in September, along with Greg Simpkins, our chief of staff on the subcommittee, when we were in Jos, Nigeria. And then in Washington, when we held a hearing on the terror group Boko Haram last October. It was in the face of this man that I was able to witness the face of the persecuted church once again, which indeed is also the face of Christ. Habila Adamu is a businessman from Yobi State in northern Nigeria. On the night of November 28, 2012, masked gunmen arrived with AK-47s and entered his home. They told his wife to leave and they were there to do the, quote, work of Allah. The questioning began, are you a policeman? He said, no. Are you a Nigerian soldier? They, he said, no. Are you a Christian? He said, yes. Then they asked him why he has not accepted Islam, which he has heard when he has heard the message of Muhammad. He replied, I am a Christian. We are also preaching the gospel of the true God to you and to other people who do not yet know God. They then asked Habila, are you ready to die as a Christian? He said, I am ready to die as a Christian. They asked him again, are you ready to die as a Christian? He replied, I am ready. And before he had closed his mouth, a bullet ripped through him. You could see the exit point of the wound in the photo before you. And he sat right there at our witness table and told his story. And you could have heard a pin drop in this hearing room as he related to us what he had been through. I thought while he was testifying, how many of us would I? Uh, have the courage to stare at martyrdom in the face and refuse to renounce Christ. And he amazingly professed nothing but love and a sense of reconciliation, even for those who had so badly mistreated him. And his face is still, as you would expect, very badly scarred. Habila Adamu, by the grace of God, as I said, he did survive and testify. The term hero is one thrown around loosely these days. He is truly a hero. And there are so many more like him, many whose names we don't know and are known only to God. We will hear today stories from around the world where Christians are under attack, again, simply because of the beliefs that they profess. We'll hear witnesses discuss persecution in places such as Burma, Vietnam, Eritrea, even in this hemisphere. According to some estimates, China is on track to become the largest Christian nation in the world, though members are hard to pin down because most of these Christians remain underground and cannot worship freely. As U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom Commissioner Elliot Abrams points out in his testimony, independent Protestants and Catholics continue to face persecution for refusing to affiliate with government-approved religious groups. Protestant house church groups that refuse to join the state-approved Protestant religious organizations are deemed illegal and experience harassment, fines, detention, and imprisonment and torture. Approximately 900 Protestants were detained in the past year for conducting public worship activities. Seven Protestant leaders were also in prison for terms exceeding a year. The Chinese government issued a directive to eradicate unregistered Protestant churches over the next 10 years, including through force. 
Police have embraced the plane, plan, I should say, raiding meetings, seeking to break up large churches that previously operated openly, and detaining religious leaders. They are on a tear. It has gotten worse in China. It has not gotten better. I would note again, parenthetically, Frank Wolf and I, right before the Olympics, went to China to meet with a number of house church leaders. Every one of them were arrested, detained, roughed up, and the one that we did meet with, after the fact, he too uh, was persecuted simply for meeting with two congressmen, simply for trying to live out their faith uh, as they see fit. The Chinese government continues to appoint bishops without Vatican approval and place them in leadership positions, setting back Vatican-Beijing relations. Dozens of Catholic clergy, including three bishops, remain in detention, in home confinement, under surveillance, or have disappeared. Bishop Thaddeus Ma Daquan, the auxiliary bishop of Shanghai, has been missing since he publicly announced his resignation from the state-approved Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association in June of 2012. Bishop Xu of Baoding, picture right over there on the extreme left. I met with him in the early 1990s. He had already spent several decades in the, in the Lao Gai. He was tortured, and yet this man had nothing but, but a sense of love and reconciliation towards his tormentors. And a few months later, he was rearrested. A few years later, he was arrested and now has disappeared. And we don't know where he is. He may even be dead at the hands of his captors. When he celebrated mass in a dingy little apartment, I, there was nothing, not even the slightest hint of malice in Bishop Shu's eyes or words. He prayed for his tormentors. I was, I was dumbfounded by that faith. It just totally inspired. In Vietnam, the name one of these countries uh, where churches are forced to register and worship outside of state authorized churches is forbidden. Christian ethnic minorities such as the Hmong and Montagnard are allowed to exist in uneasy tension with the governing authorities, knowing that the heavy hand of the state could stop their worship at any time. Vietnam's Catholic, both clergy and laity, filled Vietnamese jails as prisoners of conscience for calling the government to account to a higher law than that of arbitrary dictates. The attack on, Catholic, the, attack on the Catholic funeral procession in the village of Condell in 2010 resulted in more than 100 villagers being injured, 62 arrested, five tortured, and at least three deaths. This should remind one of the brutality that Christians face uh, in Vietnam. As I mentioned Vietnam, because now in secrecy, negotiations are being held over the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Vietnam's seeks entry, and if we focus on the unity, utility, and profits of increased trade without holding Vietnam to account for its human rights record, we miss an opportunity to better the lives of those who are beaten, imprisoned, and even killed for their faith. I met Father Lee when he was under house arrest. Father Lee is now back in custody. And if you ever, and we'll bring it down, we have a picture of him while he was before the magistrate. And secret police are holding his face, and this man, uh, this great Christian Catholic leader who wants nothing but democracy and religious freedom for his country, has been beaten, and he, along with so many others of different faiths in Vietnam, uh, continue to languish in the prisons throughout Vietnam. I would like to thank our witnesses for, for most of them traveled here to be with us today from great distances and at their own expense. It's important to hear from voices from outside the Beltway, and we appreciate our witnesses coming here from as far away as India, the United Kingdom, Mexico, and from, uh, from within the United States, from Denver and from New York. And lest we appear ungrateful, thanks to the incomparable U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and especially its commissioner here today, Elliot Abrams, who I and members of this committee have known for over three decades. He once walked point as Assistant Secretary for Human Rights under the Reagan administration. Uh, thank him for his extraordinary leadership over these many years. And one brief word about protocol and procedure, we will hear from Archbishop uh, Francis Chulakot, the representative of the Holy See to the United Nations. As Archbishop Chulakot holds the equivalent of the rank of ambassador, he will not be testifying in the purest sense of that word, but rather briefing Congress this morning pursuant to our House rules. Uh, and he will, uh, and, and we will then go to our other witnesses uh, when we reconvene as a hearing. And I, I would like to say Frank Wolf is here, and. Uh, 
the USERF was created by the legislation that he wrote back in 1998. Landmark legislation called the International Religious Freedom Act. Uh, I want to thank him for his extraordinary leadership over these many years. Uh, and again, Elliot Abrams is now here as part of that commission, and I thank him again for his leadership. I'd like to yield uh, to Dana Rohrbacher, uh, Chairman Rohrbacher, for any comments you might have. Thank you very much, and I uh, would like to thank the Chairman for the time and effort that he puts in to try to save the lives of suffering people uh, throughout the world. We have the opportunity here in America to make a difference with our outrage, but we have to express that outrage, and we have to make sure that our voices are loud, are clear, and specific in order to save those oppressed people who are perhaps uh, the closest to saints uh, that we have today and that people are suffering uh, for their own religious convictions. Um, I think America is a little bit hesitant about being as aggressive as we should be. And I think that's because in a world that's filled with suffering, that we, and we are a country that is a vast majority of our people consider themselves Christians, that we are self-conscious in thinking that if we speak up with a loud voice about the persecution of Christians, that in this will appear self-serving to our own uh, political ends. Uh, the fact is that Christians are being slaughtered today, uh, and we are in an era when that slaughter is being ignored. We today are calling upon our fellow members of Congress but also on the American people to step forward with a loud voice and stand by our fellow Christians, but also people of other faiths, but today we're focusing on, on Christians, to stand beside those who are suffering for their religious convictions. We need every community who has religious convictions to stand together when any community whether it's Christians or Jews or Muslims or Buddhists, we need to stand together in unity to send a message because this truly is the issue of righteousness versus evil. And we as believers must stand together if evil is to be defeated. So um, we went through communism where ideologically we had a, a, a group, a large group of millions of people who felt that it was their job to displace the belief in God, period, with, an, with atheist dictatorship, because that would restructure the world. Well, that was an evil that we faced, and I'm so happy to have stood with many of you and with Elliot and, and others to help defeat that force when it was an expanding force in the world. Well, now we face another evil, and that is where people who are fanatics in their own faith are, are committing horrible acts against people of other beliefs. And especially today, we focus on Christians. So today, we call on all of the good people of the world to join us, speak loudly and, and aggressively against this evil so that too can be defeated and fall into, as Ronald Reagan said, the ash heap of history. And hopefully our children will see a world to, in which they say, you mean people who believed in God in a different way killed each other back then? We can create that kind of world, but we have to commit ourselves to it. And I am so grateful, uh, I'm so grateful, Mr. Chairman, to your leadership and Frank Wolf and others who have spent so much time and effort in their political life to try to make this difference in the world. Uh, thank you very much. Jeremy Robacker, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and thank each of you, some of my friends who are here with us today. And I'll be very brief. It, it is important that we emphasize this particular uh, story because so many times it does not get reported. Uh, atrocities happen across our world. And quite frankly, they go uh, as a very small 
headline on a back page of some newspaper somewhere. And for us to highlight that is a critical component. Uh, the priority that it should be for not only this Congress, but for the American people uh, is a story that is steeped in freedom and really economic prosperity. And because when you look at it, when you have freedom, you truly have the economic prosperity that goes with that. And so um, as a priority, I mean, many of us have a number of other conflicting things. Uh, I, I know I have four hearings today, and, and I've chosen to be here because this is a critical time and uh, where we can make a difference. So I look forward to hearing your testimony and your briefing, and I, I thank you so much, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so very much. I'd like to now yield to the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, uh, Frank Wolf, again, the author of the International Religious Freedom Act. Uh, I'd like to yield to uh, Joe Pitts, the chairman of the Health Committee on Energy and Commerce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Although I, I'm not on this committee, thank you for uh, asking us to attend, and thank you for holding this uh, very important and timely hearing. It is disheartening, to say the least, that this committee needs to hold a hearing bearing the title, The Worldwide Persecution of Christians. I've sat on numerous hearings over the last few years focusing on the persecution of specific religious minorities, but it is evident that there is a global systemic, uh, sy systematic uh, persecution uh, of those around the world that profess the Christian faith. And this persecution reaches every region of the world. It's not deterred by any political structure or strength of the state. Uh, whether Christians find themselves in a country with an authoritarian government or a theistic state or even a popular democracy, Christian minorities are vulnerable to and have been encountering denial of rights, uh, by government regimes. Uh, they've been encountering communal violence, even specific targetings that result in ransom and terrorism and even murder. In cases where Christians are facing government restrictions or abuse by the state, our, our government holds an obvious venue for addressing these issues through our dialogue with those states. Specifically, states in recent years have increased the enforcement and or the adopted uh, laws that deter conversion or de deem certain expression of faith as blasphemy. Whether it be Kazakhstan, uh, its 2011 laws restricting religious activity, or Pakistan's anti-blasphemy laws, or the anti-conversion laws in many states in India, including the populous state of Gujarat, our government can and must speak out and elevate policies that address these issues. Late last year, Keith Ellison and I introduced a resolution calling for the repeal of the anti-conversion laws in India, and it calls for religious freedom and related human rights to be included in the United States-India strategic dialogue. It's my belief that we need a corresponding escalation of policies with all of our allies and within all of our strategic relationships in order to combat this worldwide and systemic persecution. So I look forward to hearing the recommendations of our witnesses and thank them for their participation today. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing us to sit in. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Pitts. And I would also note that Chairman Pitts has been a leader on assisting Christians in Burma, uh, other places as well. But Burma, he has had a special heart for those suffering, the Karen and, and, and others. Uh, so I thank him for that leadership, which he has helped. We've all gotten behind him on those efforts. Uh, pursuant to the House rules, uh, in order to receive a briefing from a diplomat deployed to the United Nations, uh, the hearing stands in brief recess, subject to the call of the chair. Uh, and then we will go back to the hearing setting. So Archbishop Chulakot, if you uh, could uh, come and present your testimony. Uh, Archbishop Francis Chulakot uh, is from the Holy See Mission to the United Nations was appointed by Pope Benedict the 16th to be permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations in New York in July of 2010. He previously served the Holy See as apostolic nuncio to Iraq and Jordan, where he served from 2006 until 2010. Previously, he served as a priest and as the secretary to an archbishop in his native India. He has also served as a diplomat in Honduras, 
Southern Africa and in the Philippines. And without objection, his full resume will be made a part of the record. Archbishop Chilicot, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Smith, I wish also to recognize other members of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Rohrbacher, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Wolf, and uh, Mr. Pitts. And I wish also to recognize uh, Mr. Elliott for his presence here. And uh, to all our members who are invisibly present on this panel, uh, and uh, all our audience. I'm so happy to be here and so thankful for giving me this uh, opportunity to come and brief all of you about the topic that we are discussing during this hearing. It is such a vital uh, issue that we have to consider very seriously, as I say, when these things or these symptoms start manifesting, we have to nip in the bud. Otherwise, it would start as a sign of intolerance, and later on, it will move to the stage of discrimination, and thereafter, will definitely come about that final stage of persecution, which we are going to talk about. So thank you for this opportunity once again to address you and the committee today. Your recognition of the consequential need to consider and respond effectively to existing and emerging threats to religious freedom in the world today is indeed commendable. Such threats manifest not solely under authoritarian regimes or in traditional societies, but even I regret to say, in the great de democracies in the world. The Constitution of the United States apprehends well what the Holy See consistently affirms, namely, that religious freedom is also the first freedom, a fundamental human right, from which other rights necessarily flow and which must always be protected, defended, and promoted. Pope Benedict XVI identified religious freedom as, and I quote, the pinnacle of all other freedoms. It is a sacred and inalienable right. It includes on the individual and collective levels the freedom to follow one's conscience in religious matters and at the same time freedom of worship. It includes the freedom to choose the religion which one judges to be true and to manifest one's beliefs in public. It must be possible to profess and freely manifest one's religion and its symbols without endangering one's life and personal freedom. Religious freedom is rooted in the dignity of the person. Its safe hearts it safeguards moral freedom and fosters mutual respect." Unquote. Every government bears the profound responsibility to guarantee in its constitution, as your First Amendment and the entire text secure, religious freedom for its people and must moreover uphold religious liberty, both in principle and in fact. Today, however, Religious persecution, be it overt or discreet, is emerging with an increased frequency worldwide. Even in some of the Western democracies, the long-standing paragons of human rights and freedoms, we find instances of increasingly less subtle signs of persecution, including the legal prohibition of the display of Christian symbols and imagery legitimate expressions of beliefs that for centuries has enriched culture, be they on the person or on public property. This suggests a profound identity crisis at the heart of these great democracies, which owe to their encounter with Christianity, both their origin and culture, 
including their human rights culture. I personally have witnessed many egregious threats to religious liberty during my service around the globe, especially in Iraq and in Jordan, where I served for four years as apostolic nuncio uh, of the Holy See. My current posting also makes me familiar with the work of the United Nations, which your great nation has helped establish when the world society was desperate for an institution whose mission would be to secure and maintain the international peace and security. The founding charter of the United Nations mandates that it fulfill this mission through safeguarding the fu fundamental and inalienable rights and responsibilities of each member of the human family. The preservation of authentic religious freedom thus stands at the heart of the UN solemn responsibility. Having said this, allow me to address the following two points in my brief remarks. I will also be submitting to the committee two more detailed texts for your further consideration. The first issue on which I wish to focus today concerns challenges to religious freedom in the Middle East, particularly for Christians, who since the beginning of Christianity 2,000 years ago have been continuous inhabitants of that important region of the world. A second issue I will touch upon briefly concerns the responsibility of the United Nations towards safeguarding this religious freedom. I also wish to highlight the crucial role the United States of America bears in the work of the UN by virtue of its significant influence with this organization as well as its permanent membership in the Security Council. Regarding my first point, flagrant and widespread persecution of Christians rages in the Middle East even as we meet. No Christian is exempt whether he or not, he or she is Arab. Arab Christians, a small but significant community, find themselves the target of constant harassment for no reason other than their religious faith. This tragedy is all the more egregious when one poses to consider that these men and women of faith are loyal sons and daughters of the countries in which they are full citizens and in which they have been living at peace with their neighbors and fellow citizens for untold generations. One of the most graphic illustrations of ongoing brutality confronting Arab Christians is the emergence of a so-called tradition within inverted commas of bombings of Christian Catholic and other Christian houses of worship every Christmas Eve, which has been going on now for the past several years. Will there be no end in sight for this senseless slaughter for those who on that very night proclaim the birth of the Prince of Peace in some of the oldest Christian communities in the world. As is increasingly obvious, governments are by no means guaranteeing religious freedom consistently among fundamental human rights. And at worst, violations take the form of the outright persecution of religious believers by state actors. For its part, the Holy See regularly urges the world's attention to serious violations of the right to religious freedom in general, as well as to recent and continuing instances of discrimination or systematic attacks on Christian communities in particular. In a recent statement to the United Nations Human Rights Council, the permanent observer of the Holy See to the United Nations in Geneva said the following, and I quote, Research has indicated that more than 100,000 Christians are violently killed because of some relation to their faith every year, while other Christians and believers are subjected to forced displacement, to the destruction of their places of worship, to rape, and to the abduction of their leaders. 
Several of these acts have been perpetrated in parts of the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, and are the result of bigotry, intolerance, terrorism, and some exclusionary laws. In addition, some Western countries, where historically the Christian presence has been an integral part of the society, a trend emerges that tends to marginalize Christianity in public life, ignore historic and social contributions, and even restrict the ability of faith communities to carry out social charitable services." Unquote. Pope Francis himself, in praying recently for all Christians who experience discrimination on the basis of their belief, stated, and I quote, let us remain close to these brothers and sisters who, like the first martyr of the church, St. Stephen, are unjustly accused and made the objects of various kinds of violence. Unfortunately, I am sure there are more numerous, they are more numerous today than in the early days of the church. They are so many. This occurs especially where religious freedom is still not guaranteed or fully re realized. However, it also happens in countries and areas where, where on paper, freedom and human rights are protected, but where in fact believers, and especially Christians, face restrictions and discrimination." Unquote. His predecessor, Pope Benedict XVI, similarly pointed out the same problem in his 2012 address to the members of the diplomatic corps accredited to the Holy See. At that time, he stressed the following, in many countries, and I'm quoting here his words, in many countries, Christians are deprived of fundamental rights and sidelined from public life. In other countries, they endure violent attacks against their churches and their homes. At times, they are forced to leave the countries they have helped to build because of persistent tensions and policies which frequently relegate them to being second-class spectators of national life. And in other parts of the world, we see policies aimed at marginalizing the role of religion in the life of society. It even happens that believers and Christians in particular are prevented from contributing to the common good by their educational and charitable institutions." Unquote. Mr. Chairman, this past autumn, in a message to the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew I, Pope Francis called to mind the 1,700th anniversary of the Edict of Milan, which brought about the end to the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire and drew attention to the many Christians of all the churches and ecclesial communities who in many parts of the world experience discrimination and at, at times pay with their own blood the price of their profession of faith. The Pope also stressed the urgent need for effective and committed cooperation among Christians in order to safeguard everywhere the right to express publicly one's faith and to be treated fairly when promoting the contribution which Christianity continues to offer to contemporary society and culture. Current circumstances make it particularly important that Christians work together to ensure religious freedom for all. And to this end, it is crucial that every government guarantee religious freedom for each and every person in its country, not only in its legislation, but also in practice. Strictly connected to religious freedom is respect for conscientious objection, of which everyone should be able to avail himself or herself. Conscientious objection is based on religious, ethical, and moral reasons, and on the universal demands of human dignity. As such, it is a pillar of every truly democratic society, and precisely for this reason, civil law 
must always and everywhere recognize and protect it. After all, these steps ensure not only human dignity, but the dignity of democratic institutions. Regarding my second point, which concerns the United Nations, the essential importance of religious freedom for each and every person, community, and society is confirmed by the foundational international legal instruments and other documents. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states the following, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or, or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. This is from Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Since the summer of 2010, Mr. Chairman, as the Holy See's representative to the United Nations, I have labored alongside many people of goodwill to bring an end to the suffering in the world. The religious persecution of Christians throughout the Middle East looms large in this theater of suffering. The United Nations General Assembly addresses the question in certain resolutions which we have a hand in negotiating. However, these noble efforts fail to receive the profile they justly deserve on the world stage. Only member states, especially with leadership profiles like the United States, can take decisive steps to ensure that the non-derogable human right of religious liberty becomes more robustly protected worldwide. The self-evident truths underlying healthy democracy, truths upon which both President Jefferson and the church agree, require as much. The religious freedom which the law is expected to protect and promote abides no mere passive toleration, but requires rather that states guarantee the basic preconditions that permit its free exercise by citizens in both their private and public endeavors. Allow me now to express my gratitude for efforts this committee uh, undertakes in promoting religious liberty and those it will undertake in this issue to bring an end to further suffering and social exclusion of Christians. As I mentioned, I also leave for your consideration two documents of crucial concern to my test, to my briefing today. The lineamenta or guidelines for the 2009 Synod of Bishops Special Assembly for the Middle East, which I had a strong role in promoting when I was nuncio to Iraq and Jordan, and the second document is Pope Benedict XVI's 2011 World Day of Peace message entitled Religious Freedom, the Path to Peace. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I express my gratitude to you and to this subcommittee for this important opportunity to express solidarity with all Christian believers in the harsh reality of the persecution of their communities and adherents at this present time. And we look to your country to stand true to its own constitution and to show its leadership in every forum in working to end the erosion of this most fundamental of human rights. I thank you for the attention. Archbishop Shulika, thank you for your very eloquent statement, for your never-ending, indomitable effort on behalf of, of beleaguered Christians and people of all faiths throughout the world, particularly in your posting at the United Nations. Um, I know some of the members would just like to make a very brief statement. I'll make a very brief question statement. Uh, as agonizing it is for adults to endure uh, and mentally process the discrimination that comes in many parts of the world for being a Christian, uh, I've often wondered and you lived it in Iraq, uh, how the most vulnerable among us, especially children, cope uh, with being attacked, taunted, having their parents beaten, maybe even killed 
maybe even brothers and sisters, uh, and, and wounded themselves simply because they are Christians? How does a young person deal with this? Thank you for raising that question because this is one of the heartbreaking stories that I had to witness on a daily basis when I was in, uh, in Iraq, especially as you are mentioning and highlighting uh, uh, with uh, so much of passion that you have always demonstrated, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the suffering of these people around the world, especially those countries uh, in which uh, the Christians, because of their faith, they are undergoing this kind of uh, discrimination, intolerance, and persecution. And uh, when I look at those children, those innocent victims of this kind of persecution, where they have to live in fear just because they happen to be Christians. They have not committed any crime. They are children. And even if uh, they were to follow these kind of atrocious and horrible stories on a daily basis on the TV screen, which I'm sure that will be affecting psychologically these children. And when they go to the schools, when they are not even sure whether they'll, they'll come back safe and sound or alive after the school. And sometimes when they see in front of their own eyes, when the car bombs explode and the human bodies are torn apart and this kind of horrible, as scenes, don't you think that will leave a lasting scar in their memory, in their mind, and in their entire life? And here we are talking about a new generation of Iraqi society that has to be built up. And is this kind of a society, a generation that we want to build up? And whom are we going to blame later on if some of these children were to end up within the terrorist groups? Because these are the kind of crimes that they are witnessing on a daily basis. And now, you need only to turn on the TV screen, you can see that on a daily basis, car bombs are going off in Iraq. And do you think that people don't see it? Do you think that the Children don't see this kind of atrocious acts that are being taking place. And is this the kind of formation that we are giving to the young generations that have to become the future leaders of the country? So it is really a painful thing. It is not only the, the terrorist acts that are being committed, but the impact it will have on the incoming generation that, we have to be, uh, born in, that has to be born in mind. So that is where some of the painful um, uh, um, feelings that I always used to have when I was seeing this kind of uh, um, um, horrible things and, uh, and, and this uh, bloody uh, attacks that um, continuously being repeated uh, within the Iraqi society. And I hope that the, the government will take all the necessary measures so that peace and security can be brought uh, to that land because that is the most essential thing at this point in time the Iraqi society wants. And thank you for that question. Thank you for the overview that you have given us today. Um, <clears throat> just like to ask uh, something that's been perplexing for me on this issue, and that is uh, when you look at the Middle East, it's my understanding, and why I'm asking this, is if it's uh, incorrect, I'd like you to correct this misperception that I have, that under Saddam Hussein, uh, Christians actually had, uh, were more protected than now that you have a more democratic government. And I understand that that may be true uh, with Assad as well in Syria. Um, maybe you could give me a little insight into that, and sh should that mean that, uh, what does that mean by how we should approach this problem? Um, with regard to the security uh, that uh, prevailed during uh, those uh, regimes, 
what happened was because of the policy of the government of the regime at that time, there was security uh, not only for the minorities but all over the country because uh, under a dictatorship, of course, you know, there is law and order both in place but oftentimes uh, it is what it is. So not only the minorities but throughout the, the country, you know, you could also take a walk during, the, during midnight uh, and, and nothing will happen to you because there was law and order which was forcibly imposed uh, on the situation of the country. Uh, so, of course, the, the minority, uh, minorities benefited from that. But it was not just for the minority, but it's all over the country. So anybody who dared to question the, uh, the regime, of course, we know what, what, what happened. So it is under that, uh, that threat of uh, the consequences that anybody would go to undergo uh, during uh, those, uh, the time of those regimes uh, that the, the, the so-called security and peace prevailed in those societies. Uh, and of course, the minorities felt protected because they were participants on the, bene the, the benefits that, uh, that, um, that came about from this uh, strict law and order that were imposed by those regimes. I think that was one of the reasons, although uh, sometimes it is being interpreted as it was a special protection that was offered uh, to the minorities. Uh, and the minorities, of course, because of the, uh, the situation that prevailed, they could exercise all their rights, and uh, they, were, uh, they were free to, uh, the, the freedom of worship especially, as it happens in, uh, in Jordan, for example, uh, as it happened in Syria. Now, in Syria, what we see is, is practically a replay of what happened in, in Iraq. Uh, and you can already see now what is happening in Syria is having its own spillover effect both in Iraq, and, uh, and we have seen what happened recently in Fallujah, and the same thing also in Lebanon. So um, uh, during the time of the uh, intervention in, uh, in Iraq, the spillover effect was in Jordan and Syria, uh, also Lebanon and Turkey, the same thing is being seen also at this time, unfortunately, uh, for what is happening in Syria, and where also the minorities now, especially the Christians, are also starting to leave the country. And there's one of the, this is called the silent exodus of Christians from Syria. So uh, it, it is so sad to see the same uh, thing is being repeated uh, over and over again. And, and I hope this will be the last time that we are seeing uh, such uh, uh, this um, conflict that is taking place in those countries. Uh, and because of this conflict, the Christians are caught in the crossfire and they are becoming the, the most vulnerable group that is paying the highest price. Thank Mr. you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that answer. It's, that's really helping me to have an understanding of that perplexing uh, analysis that I, when I looked at the rally. So thank you very much for clearing that up. Thank you. Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you. It's good to see you again. Uh, when we met the last time, uh, one of the things that struck me was your heart for people of all faiths. There was not a political uh, agenda there. One of the things that we struggle with in, in raising the persecution of, of Christians or of Jews is that it sometimes gets uh, put in political perspective of trying to uh, take a government and putting, putting a government out of control, and that's uh, most often is not the agenda. So how would we, how would we uh, show a heart for the people without uh, a government entity looking at it as an overt uh, threat to their, their national sovereignty, where we're really looking at, at protecting those that are being per persecuted? What, what advice would you give us on that? This issue has been brought up also during many sessions of the Security Council, which they call the regime change, uh, that oftentimes uh, seems to be the, the scope of some of the interventions. But as it is happening now, yesterday I started the Geneva II conference that has been res resumed in Geneva. Um, we have so much of the other possibilities 
to bring the government accountable for what is happening in there, especially when they are violating the fundamental human rights. And that is why the policy has always promoted uh, and supported the diplomatic channel that has to be exhausted first and foremost. And I'm so happy to see that in the case of Syria, that is what is taking place now, although it is a little late, but it is better late than never. The Geneva II Conference is the right process to follow, where all sectors of the society join in in deciding the future of that nation. Because after all, we are not going to live in Syria. The Syrians are going to live in Syria, and they have to take the ownership of their country and their future. And they are the ones to shape how to run their country. And the international community is there to support and facilitate this process. And this is the process that the Holy See has been always promoting. And uh, uh, myself, as, as the representative of the Holy See, I will also join in wholeheartedly in moving forward this process. It's not only in Syria, wherever it happens, we should make the people of that nation take the ownership of the destiny of that nation. And then we bring in our support and facilitate that process and to hold the governments when they are violators of the fundamental human rights and the democratic principles accountable. And we have International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, and we have all the mechanisms set in place and why don't we make use of that? So immediate military intervention is not the solution. And we know what happened in those uh, instances that we decided for the military intervention without having a precise exit strategy. It is very easy to go in and start the conflict, and afterwards, oftentimes, we don't know how to get out of it. So without any exit strategy, we should not go in into any nation and start a, a policy or project that would not bring us a, a satisfactory solution. Thank you. Thank you. you? Chairman Wolf, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a very quick question. Thank you for your testimony. I found it very, very helpful. Uh, out in the region, I've heard people use the expression, first the Saudi people and then the Sunni people, meaning that they eliminate the Jewish population and then they eliminate the Christian population. I was also told that in Iraq, and you may have the numbers differently, that in 1950, the Jewish population was roughly 150,000. I was told that it may now be down to maybe four or five individuals. Uh, what was the, if, if that accurate, if you could help me, but what was the Christian population in Iraq, say, in the year 2000? And what is the Christian population in Iraq now? Thank you. There has not been any census, official census, that was being done uh, in Iraq about the, uh, even the population at large. Uh, so it is still being uh, disputed, the, the different um, uh, figures that, uh, that we uh, see in the, in the news reports and from uh, the church authorities there. Uh, uh, yesterday, I was uh, reading one of the statements by the Chaldean patriarch, uh, Petria Sacco, uh, who mentioned that in Iraq, at this point in time, there are half a million uh, Christians. So this is the, the, the number that he gave. Uh, in fact, that seems to correspond to the representation of Christians in the parliament. Uh, there are five representatives of the Christian community in the parliament, which is based on the 100,000 uh, Christians, uh, would uh, uh, represent one uh, parliamentary representative. So they have five. So th I think that that number goes together with the quota system that has been introduced in the Iraqi parliament. But my guess is that it should be between 300 and 350,000 Christians. Uh, because of the ongoing exodus of Christians from, from Iraq. Uh, um, and you know that if you go to Detroit or California, you can see the number of Iraqis uh, that have settled in the, uh, in the United States, and the same thing also in, uh, in uh, Regarding the Jewish um, exodus, I think they were also 
because of a minority there, they had to go through the same fate, you know, because once uh, the, uh, the fight between the Sunnis and Shia started, uh, the, the minorities were, uh, were the targets also. Uh, the Christians, for example, in a, in a place in Baghdad called Dora, it used to be practically a, a Christian uh, um, town there, but now there is nobody left over there. There will be a few families there. Because of the threat uh, of security that they have, the insecurity that they are experiencing, they all moved out to the northern part of Iraq. Uh, in the case of Jews, the same thing. Or the, or the Mandaeans, or, or the, or the Shebaks, uh, or, the, or, the, or the Turkmens, we, they are all victims of this sectarian violence that is going on in Iraq. So nobody has been exempt from it, uh, including the Jews. Uh, the only people who are now uh, protecting themselves in a, in a stable manner are the, are the Kurdish people, because they have a semi-autonomous region in the northern part of uh, Iraq where uh, they can exercise a quasi-independence. So, but all of the minorities, uh, they are being targeted and they are the victims of the sectarian violence that is happening in Iraq. Thank you. Chairman Pitts. Thank you, uh, Archbishop, for your testimony. We're all familiar with the Soviet model of imposing registration of churches that some of the emerging republics have have uh, adopted, like Kazakhstan, that has resulted in crackdown on, on minority Christian groups. We're familiar with the, uh, the anti-blasphemy laws, that, like in Pakistan, that has resulted in the strong in society taking advantage of the weak with false charges on, on blasphemy. I'm interested in your view of the anti-conversion laws in some of the states in India and the impact on minorities. Could you elaborate on that, please? Thank you for asking that question also because I am from India uh, originally. So uh, we, we are really worried about this anti-conversion well because India uh, is expected to be one of the great democracies in the world. And India has thrived so far, uh, so well. It is because of that multi-religious and multicultural uh, democratic system that you have put in place. But as we know, there will always be uh, some radical elements within the uh, Indian society, and this is the uh, re-emergence and uh, emergence of these radical groups in India uh, that are uh, making such an out of lot of noise around the world. And unfortunately, there are some political parties uh, in India uh, who are indirectly supporting these radical groups. Uh, and so they feel emboldened because of this indirect support that they get from certain political parties uh, within the Indian political system. Uh, and uh, they take that kind of liberty in going after the minorities, especially the Christians. And uh, you mentioned about Orissa is one of those states where this anti-conversion will is put in place which is unfortunate because uh, re if the religious freedom is being respected, this is totally against, and there's no way you can, you can justify uh, such a law. How could you uh, possibly imagine that in order to convert to other religion or to renounce your own religion, you need a piece of paper from the state government? Uh, this is absurd. And uh, uh, the, the bishops in India have been uh, complaining about it, they have presented to the to the the, um, the national government. Uh, they are protest. They are they express many times, but it seems that because of these certain parties, political parties, who are supporting these radical groups within the society, they are having a free hand in exercising this kind of uh, discriminatory uh, um, actions against uh, the minorities, religious minorities, especially the Christians. And uh, I think the United States can do a lot in putting pressure on the Indian government to put in place uh, the laws that would respect. The laws are already there. It's only a matter of implementing that law at the state level uh, so that these minorities are protected also in India. Because once the sectarian violence starts in India, that will bring in eventually the fragmentation of the Indian society. We don't want that to happen. So we are not. Uh, we are still early to do that, uh, that kind of uh, 
legal system to be put in place so that India can truly and, and uh, really enjoy uh, the fruits of the true democracy uh, and to show to the world that it, it can really um, show to the world that India is indeed a democratic country where everybody enjoys uh, his or her rights to the fullest manner and the, the Indian government will be there to protect especially the minorities uh, in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Pitts. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Archbishop Chulakot. We deeply appreciate your testimony and your leadership. Uh, this official briefing is now concluded. We will now reconvene a hearing of the subcommittee. I'd like to now welcome to the witness table our first panel of the official hearing, uh, beginning with Mr. Abrams, Elliot Abrams, uh, who is Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations in Washington. He served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor in the administration of George Bush, where he supervised U.S. policy in the Middle East for the White House. Mr. Abrams was educated at Harvard College, the London School of Economics, and Harvard Law School. After serving on the staffs of Senator Jackson and Daniel Moynihan, he was Assistant Secretary of State in the Reagan administration and received the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award from Secretary George P. Schultz. Mr. Abrams was President of the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington from 1996 until joining the White House staff. He was a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, the first in 1999 to 2001, and Chairman of the Commission uh, in the latter year and is serving an additional term as member now, 2012 to 2014. Mr. Abrams is also a member of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Council, which directs the activities of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and a member of the board of the National Endowment for Democracy. He teaches U.S. foreign policy at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. And without objection, his full resume, and that's only a part of it, uh, will be made a part of the record. Secretary Abrams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the uh Subcommittee, um, thanks for inviting me to testify on behalf of the Commission and for holding the hearing. The persecution of Christians is a growing and searing affront to our uh, consciences and beliefs. Uh, for Christians struggling worldwide for the freedom to practice their faith, you're demonstrating concern and solidarity here that I think will lift their spirits, and we hope put their governments on notice that you care about this issue and will continue to shine a spotlight on their misdeeds. Uh, because of these efforts, yours and others, people know about the persecution of people like um, Pastor Saeed Abedini. I'll just hold up his, his picture um, in Iran. Uh, Asya Bibi in Pakistan, a young Catholic woman. Uh, and of course, Father Lee, who's been mentioned, Father Lee uh, in Vietnam. Um, their persecution reflects a disturbing reality for many Christians around the world. Um, there are about two billion Christians in the world in many, many countries. Um, and uh, in many of those countries, persecution is widespread. Uh, partly because in many of the countries in which they reside, they're members of small minorities, uh, ethnic minorities, language minorities, or they're viewed as linked to the West, to the United States, to Europe. Uh, and of course, um, in many cases, <clears throat> uh, Christianity represents an alternative source of authority. And if for tyrannical governments and extremist uh, non-state actors, this is viewed as a threat to their own power. Uh, so Christians and others, of course, other religious minorities, find themselves in the crosshairs often of authoritarian or totalitarian regimes on the one hand and theocracies on the other. Both of these kinds of dictatorships violate the religious freedom of Christians and others because they seek to exclude or limit these dissenters' ability to, to communicate with each, with each other, practice their faith, uh, and of course, they resent Christians' loyalty to their faith. In the case of uh, terrorist groups and other non-state actors, the problem is the presence of these private individuals or groups who commit violence against Christians, and very often, governments uh, tolerate these actions and later fail to bring the perpetrators to justice. Uh, in my written testimony, I talk about um, 18 countries and governments which are among the world's worst violators. Um, and I talk about some of the 
individuals who have been imprisoned in many of these countries for their Christian faith. Um, these names come from the Defending Freedom Project of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. And we have to mention these names, we have to shine a light on them and others until they're free and raise the re issue of religious freedom until the countries that imprisoned those prisoners of conscience comply with the international legal documents and treaties that they have signed and protect this fundamental human right. Let me just say a word about Egypt and Vietnam. Um, in Egypt, there's been uh, a good deal of sectarian violence against the cops for years. Um, and uh, especially during the Muslim Brotherhood government period of President Morsi, that year in power. Um, conservative clerics and extremists often use incendiary sectarian rhetoric and incitement without any accountability. Um, and unfortunately, the post-Morsi era has gotten off to a similarly bad start. Violent religious extremists and thugs in August launched attacks against churches throughout the country, as the Archbishop mentioned. At least seven cops were killed in more than 200 churches and other Christian religious structures, homes, businesses uh, assaulted. Just last October, four cops were killed, including two sisters aged 8 and 12 when gunmen on motorcycles opened fire at a wedding party outside a church near Cairo. Um, while the government before, during, and after the Morsi period has failed to bring to justice the perpetrators of these sectarian attacks, the courts have continued to convict and imprison Egyptians charged with blasphemy, with a disproportionate number, of course, being Christian. There's been some renewed hope among Christians in Egypt, in the uh, Christian community following the ouster of uh, President Morsi, um, and some changes to the new constitution that potentially could mean more religious freedom for Copts, um, but their situation and their future today are precarious. In Vietnam, religious conditions are poor. The Vietnamese government imprisons individuals for religious activity or advocating religious freedom, seeks to stop the growth of ethnic minority Protestantism and Catholicism. Ethnic minority Protestants and Catholics, particularly in the Central Highlands, have been arrested and beaten and for, face forced renunciations of their faith for practicing outside the approved government religious organizations. Thuong and Montagnard Protestants continue to experience government sanctions efforts to force their renunciations of faith. And the government has sanctioned violence against and arrested Catholics for peacefully advocating for religious freedom. Um, let me um, just mention again Father Lee, who's been in prison on and off um, for the crime of advocating religious freedom in Vietnam. He has spent more than 20 years in prison and was last returned to prison after a March 2007 show trial in which, as that picture shows, he was muzzled. Um, one other thing to mention um, just at the end, which is that um, in the Act, the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, the post of Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom was created. Uh, it's vacant, and it really needs to be filled. The president last week of the National Prayer Breakfast suggested a nomination would be coming quickly. Um, I hope so, because this is um, the key official within the U.S. government executive branch coordinating and developing U.S. policy for international religious freedom. And if there is a long vacancy, it weakens the attention of the executive branch, it weakens the efforts in the executive branch, and it sends a message to countries around the world of inattention and lack of concern. So I think we all hope uh, that a nomination comes forward very quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Abrams, thank you very much. And without objection, your full, very extensive testimony, which goes country by country by country, will be made a part of the record. And I do hope members, I know members who are here will read it because they're also very interested, but other members will read it. And I respectfully hope that the press will look at it as well because it, it really gives insights as to what's truly happening on a country by country basis. And I would remind uh, everyone that when your commission was established by Frank Wolf's bill, uh, the whole idea was to provide an appraisal of the situation on the ground accurately, 
uh, to be independent, to be comprehensive, because we know so often human rights uh, are, are an irritant to much of the, many of those who do statecraft uh, and religious freedom even more so. And one of the things that Mr. Wolf put in his bill was to train Foreign Service officers uh, to be much more uh, knowledgeable about all things pertaining to uh, religious freedom and religious organizations and individuals. Um, you perhaps might want to touch on whether or not you think that's happening, but I'm glad you brought up the ambassador at large, and I do hope the president follows through on his prayer breakfast promise. Uh, we've had an administration where two and a half years uh, there was an ambassador at large, but for the rest of the administration's time, tenure in office, there has been no ambassador at large, and that is the point person. And um, so that's a, a missed opportunity that is huge, and I hope that is filled soon. Uh, just one general question, if I could. Um, do you find when the commission makes its recommendations, like uh, which countries ought to be designated countries of particular concern, CPC, as you have done repeatedly with Vietnam, for example, uh, do you find that the administration is receptive or do they push back? Um, you know, we, we push too. Uh, you know, we've been trying to get the administration uh, and in every time, you know, a high official appears, whether it be on Vietnam or, or other, uh, I and others do raise the issue, what is the delay uh, in promulgating those designations? And then, just as important, ensuring that step two, the other shoe, that real sanctions, and there are 18 of them prescribed in the act, uh, are followed up on. And some of those sanctions are very significant and would definitely get the attention of an offending country. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it's, the system is not working. It's not working properly. It's not working the way it was established in the Act. Um, in the, uh, it, it hasn't under several administrations, I have to say. It's not just the Obama administration. Um, the Obama administration made CPC designations only once uh, in the first four years, and the Act re requires them every year. Um, and actually, um, uh, actually, Mr. Pitts, Mr. Wolf, and you, Mr. Chairman, wrote a letter about this, of course, last May, um, which um, I'd like to submit for the record because I think it's that objection a, a, a useful uh, reminder of this. Um, the problem is, in part, that it sends a message to other governments that oh, we don't care. Um, and there are a lot of things that can be done uh, on the sanctions angle. All too often, there are no sanctions or there's a double hatting. That is, you have a country that's under some other sanction, and so you say, oh, that's for religious freedom, too. But the Act provides for a lot of flexibility. It provides an opportunity to go to a country, to a foreign government, and say, we care about this. Something needs to be done. But just as an example, um, you can take action, the US government can take action, against individual members of a foreign government who are involved in religious persecution, officials of that government, officials of provinces, officials of units of that government, to um, name names and say that those people, for example, will never be admitted to the United States. There's lots of flexibility, um, and I'm afraid we're not using it. And so the message that comes across is um, one of inattention, and the CPC system, I, I would say, is uh, broken. Thank you very much. Uh, and Elliot, again, thank you uh, over the years for all you've done to make sure we, we get a lot of out of focus, too. We start focusing just on some of the problems, daily problems that we have. And sometimes uh, a free people can forget the big picture. And uh, the big picture, of course, are these moral <clears throat> trends that uh, are permeating the world, and uh, that the United States should be an influence uh, in the right direction. I um, the question I have to ask you is this, and um, I'm again more perplexing question. Our business community insists that if they do business in dictatorships like China and like Vietnam now. We have business community rushing into Vietnam to take advantage of their labor. They insist that by being there and doing business, that that will help uh, reform and protect the rights 
of people like religious believers. What is the record there in terms of China and Vietnam? Have our business community, has the presence of an American business community been a positive uh, element towards uh, uh, the securing of certain rights, or has it been just the opposite, uh, or just what has the effect been? <clears throat> My impression is that it has had no positive impact. Um, that is, I'm so, yeah. My impression is that it has had no positive impact on uh, international religious freedom. I mean, we did a lot of business with Nazi Germany too uh, in the 30s, and that didn't have much of an impact on religious freedom. What has had an impact is when the U.S. government puts pressure on, and we see this in the case of Vietnam. Religious freedom has risen and fallen. The amount of persecution by the government has not stayed level. It rises and falls. And one of the bases on which it rises and falls is the Vietnamese government's impression of what it needs to do to get U.S. government approval for that commerce to increase. So uh, I don't blame the, the businessmen. That's their business. But it's up to the U.S. government, I think, to set the rules and to keep the pressure on. It would be right for us to expect that if a businessman invests like in Vietnam or, or China and uh, uh, to be able to at least enforce on their own grounds the right of these people to uh, have a Bible in their possession, et cetera? I think it would be a great uh, thing for businesses to try to do. It's hard. Uh, we see this in the case of American universities, which are active in China, uh, where the amount of free speech free thought, academic freedom that is available is quite limited. Uh, and universities are having to figure out, are they going to stay in China under those conditions? But I would think businesses should at least try this. I don't know if we're going to see many profiles in Courage, but it would be very nice to see a few. I would hope that uh, uh, businessmen that consider themselves Christians, I can't speak for other faiths here, but if they consider themselves to be Christians, uh, they should be willing to commit that, at least in their own operations, that they would promote and, and, and protect uh, people of faith. And, I think it's uh, a great idea. All right. Well, thank you very much, Elliot. Mr. Meadows. Thank you. It's good to see you again. Um, thank you for your service. Uh, the students at Georgetown uh, have a real jewel. Uh, I've found you to be someone who is unrelenting but analytical and, and looking at the facts. And I think that's uh, your testimony, your written testimony today is an example of that. Uh, my question for you is, is really, uh, you, you've highlighted a little bit in terms of this is not just this administration's problem. It's, it's a problem that has persisted. And yet, here in just a few minutes, I'll be meeting with business leaders, uh, representing business leaders from Egypt uh, in, in the next few minutes. And yet, most of the time when discussions happen, uh, they're either purely human rights or religious freedom discussions or purely economic and business. And it seems like that we have a tough time coupling the two together. So what would you see are the major impediments to, to doing that uh, in terms of either with the State Department or, uh, or with us as Congress? How can we do a better job of coupling those two together? Well, it is hard, particularly because businessmen are interested in serving their shareholders and, and, uh, and making a profit. So um, I think we need to give them, and we need to arm them with, with the ability to say to the Egyptians, in the case you mentioned, commerce is not going to be possible. It's not going to thrive. It's not going to grow under conditions of religious persecution and disorder, the bitterness that creates, the, the, the violence that creates in, in Egypt will be communicated to American businessmen, and they won't want to go to Egypt. There, you know, there are many other places to invest in the world. So I think the way to bring it together is try to make an argument for their self-interest, that if the American impression of Egypt is a place that is being torn by violence and sectarian hatred and persecution of Christians, they're not going to get the investment they want. 
uh, and and one follow up to that, if if you, if you don't mind. So uh, you, you mentioned about filling this particular uh, position. Uh, what else can be done in terms of um, work with the State Department to to help make this part of the dialogue when negotiations are going on? Um, well, um, when you have hearings um, and have State Department officials up here ask them about it and press them on the record of their own record or the record of their own um, part of the State Department. Um, some embassies are much better at this than others, and I think that's something worth um, asking about as well. Um, urge the administration to um, name the countries of particular concern. Um, I think it's very important also to talk about specific political prisoners in public and also with members of the administration. What has been said, it really is important. If you go back to the Soviet days, people in the Gulag told us the mentioning of names was critically important. When they heard it from a president, a secretary of state, members of Congress. So I think you can ask, um, you can do it when you visit as part of CODELS, and you can ask high officials of the executive branch to do it when they come up here uh, for testimony and when, when they visit. And then I think this question of adopting political prisoners, um, which about 20 members of Congress have done, is a great idea um, and uh, can really motivate communities back home, too. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Wolf. Uh, thank you, uh, Secretary Abrams. We welcome you. When uh, Mr. Smith was uh, reading your bio, something just popped out at me. You have worked for the two biggest giants on this issue, uh, President Reagan and Senator Jackson. And I, I guess what I wanted, and maybe this is not the time, but what, I think they were great men, so we, we just put that out there. One was a Democrat, one was a, one was a Republican. But what, what creates the Jacksons and the Reagans is it that they lead the nation because President Reagan gave the speech, the evil empire, tear down the wall. Secretary Schultz wore the bracelet, went to, went to Moscow. Scoop Jackson did what he did. But did that come from the people to the, to, to, to the Congress and the executive branch? Or did President Reagan, who is, I think, the leader, and Scoop Jackson, the leader, did they then mobilize it whereby the people then, did, am I making myself clear? Where did that come from? Let me say the be, at the beginning that I didn't work, unfortunately never worked for the third giant on this issue, which is you, Mr. Wolf. Um, I think it came from within them. I think they had a belief that these values that we're talking about were the, are the values of the American people, and that therefore our foreign policy had to reflect those values that you couldn't have a foreign policy that was what was then known as, as based on rail politique, that you had to have a foreign policy that represented the moral values of the American people, and that if you tried to do that, the American people would support that effort. So I think it came from within them, but it was based on a view of the nation and the American people that led them to say this, our foreign policy has got to reflect our moral values. Thank you, Chairman Wolf. Uh, Mr. Marino. Thank you, Chairman. I apologize for being late. I'm trying to juggle, like everyone else is, four or five things. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's a privilege and an honor to see you again. Welcome. I always enjoy our exchanges. And if I uh, am asking a question that has already been asked, just give me the high sign and I'll read the cliff notes on it. But uh, we know what persecution is taking place. We know with uh, reasonable certainty where it is taking place. What can the United States do or what should we do concerning sanctions with these countries? The bill, uh, the International Religious Freedom Act, mentions a wide variety of um, possible sanctions, some of which can be individual sanctions on officials who've engaged in persecution, 
and some of which, of course, are, are the what we usually think of, economic sanctions. Um, I think that what we need to convey to the governments that are engaging in persecution or permitting it with impunity is we care and this will affect our relations. Sanctions are not always the right formula. I think you begin by showing that you care about this and the sanctions are actually just a way of sending the message. There are many ways of sending the message. Secretary Schultz, who Mr. Wolf mentioned, did it by making sure that he raised human rights issues at the beginning of meetings with the Russians under the view that, you know, if it's the last thing you mention when the clock is running out, they know that, they see that. So he wanted to make sure they realized that for him this came first. I think there are going to be cases where, where we will find talking with them about it doesn't work. Engagement fails. Going after individual officials may fail. And you may want to try to impose some form of economic sanction to just get the message home. This will cost you in your relations with the United States. We will not have normal relations if this kind of persecution goes on. So I don't think it should be taken off the table. There will be cases where it's perhaps a last resort, but it's the right thing to do. I think it, it's got to be part of the spectrum of possible moves by the United States government. From an economic standpoint and from a trade perspective, are we in a position to deal with this? Is this something that we are looking at the lesser of the two evils and saying if we do talk about, and I'm going to focus in on sanctions, uh, monetary sanctions or trade sanctions, uh, how much of an impact, how much of a negative impact is that going to have on our economy? Well, um, it will vary, of course, Mr. Marino, from case to case. Um, in the case of uh, our sanctions on Iran, for example, um, or our sanctions a few decades ago on Iraq, I think it's hard to make an argument that it's very damaging to the United States. It's usually more damaging for the other country because we have this fantastically rich market and they want to be able to access it and they want to be able to get American investment. So I think uh, usually um, we can be the beneficiary of this. That is, we, we will not suffer very much. They'll be the ones who are suffering. There'll be cases. I mean, China obviously is a gigantic market and American businesses want to access that market. And it's also true that it's very hard um, in the case of a government like that, a communist regime, um, to speak to them persuasively on the subject of religious freedom. I know President Bush uh, tried, constantly talked to the Chinese leaders about their misunderstanding of the nature of religious freedom and of the role of religion in society. I think it's fair to say you got nowhere. Uh, so there are going to be cases where economic sanctions may actually hurt the United States and will not advance the cause of religious freedom. I think it has to be a case-by-case -case analysis. But there, there are so many, if you look at the list of countries, there are so many of them that are underdeveloped or middle income or poor, uh, and they're desperate for American investment and access to the U.S. market. And in those many cases, uh, economic and financial sanctions can have an impact. Yeah. Particularly in, uh, on the continent of Africa, uh, we have a tremendous uh, capability there. Uh, if we, uh, as we say back in Pennsylvania, play our cards right. Uh, I've been to China, uh, and met with the uh, uh, the officials, they're very polite, uh, uh, give real good lip service, and even when they're here visiting. But again, we can tell that just from the tenor of the conversation, it's we will listen, but nothing will change. So uh, I think we need to ask State to take a very serious look at these matters. I thank you again. It's a pleasure. Thank I yield you. back. Thank you. Just uh, to conclude, and just one final question, if I could. Um, Mr. Secretary, and again, your testimony speaks to one country after the other, and I appreciated you highlighting the Central African Republic. Uh, we had a hearing on November 19th here in this room, and we heard from Bishop Nungo, uh, who told us uh, how escalating the, 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 uh, the outsiders especially were um, on, the, on the radical Islamic side. You know, he said moderate Muslims, no problem, but the radicalized, just like in Nigeria with the Boko Haram. 
Uh, and yesterday there was a very heartbreaking story in the Washington Post about a man whose throat was slit, was Christian, and his family wheeling him off in a wheelbarrow. Uh, I mean, these are sorrowful situations that are beyond words. Um, one of the things that Greg Simpkins and I took away from our trip to Jos, Nigeria, we met with the evangelicals, the Christians, we went to firebomb churches, we heard at great length from individuals who had lost loved ones, who were tortured themselves, who had sadly scars from, from the flames. Uh, and in one case, the man, as I mentioned earlier, uh, who, who was literally shot in the face with an AK-47. Uh, but what the, one of the biggest takeaways, however, was that the Catholic bishop was working very closely with the imams in Jos, and I mean very close, uh, to try to put up a united front against this extremism uh, by Boko Haram. And one of the clerics said that if we speak out against Boko Haram on a Friday, we will be dead as Muslims on Saturday. So I think the more our government does uh, to, to get around all those who wish peace and reconciliation and, and, and tolerance, uh, the better. And I, again, you're prepare testimony. If you'd like to comment, that would be great. But Bishop Nungo couldn't have been more clear. And he also faulted the international community to some extent, as have others, with this idea that, well, both sides are doing it. No, there is an aggressor. We saw it uh, in Bosnia. Remember when, when people would say, oh, well, the Croats, first in Croatia, then in Bosnia. And Mr. Wolf and I were in Vukovar right before it fell, met with Slobodan Milosevic, who said he had nothing to do with the MiGs flying over, dropping bombs, and we saw it ourselves. And yet the international community says, well, both are at fault. No, one was the aggressor. Uh, one was defending themselves. And I think the same thing is happening. But I think the, the ally that, that gets overlooked is that there are a lot of mo moderate Muslims, as we saw Greg and I in, in Jos, who are saying, we want to pursue our faith. Uh, we do not want this, this violence. And secondly, uh, on your comments on, on China were excellent about not staying within the confines of the human rights dialogue. Uh, to me, that is a dead end, a cul-de-sac. Uh, it, is, it is a hermetically sealed kind of conversation. It has such limited impact. And as you know yourself, during the Bush administration, even with some of the other countries like Vietnam, we would suspend them because they were a venting you know, it, it was an X in the box for State Department people to come to that table and say, oh, but we're having a human rights dialogue. It needs to be integrated with all things uh, related to that country. And as you pointed out, all of the sanctions prescribed by Mr. Wolf's bill vis-a-vis -vis China, and you said it earlier, why aren't they being adhered to? Why aren't we making a huge point of holding torturers of Christians in, in all faiths so they don't get visas. It means making a list. It means some due diligence on the part of state. Uh, and I would say, parenthetically, I also did a bill in 2000, the Admiral Nance Meg Donovan International Foreign Relations Act was my law. We put a provision there that said on a related human rights abuse, forced abortion, that anyone involved with that heinous crime is inadmissible to the US. We asked the Congressional Research Service how often it's been implemented, less than 30 times. And that was, you know, on a crime against women that has been without parallel. So, Secretary, if you want any concluding remarks, but you, thank you for your... Just very briefly, Mr. Chairman, thank you again for holding this hearing. I think that something was said at the very beginning, that we, we as a country have been reluctant to weigh in on the question of persecution of, of Christians in particular. Um, and we shouldn't be. It's not a form of colonialism or imperialism. It's a defense of human rights. It's a defense of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All these countries have pledged to protect religious freedom, um, and they're violating their own pledges. So we should not be at all restrained or hesitant in raising this and pressing this cause. And I thank you for doing it today. Thank you so much, Secretary Abrams. I'd like to now welcome our third panel, uh, beginning first with Mr. John Allen. Uh, who is an American journalist who specializes in news about the Catholic Church and is considered one of the foremost experts on the Vatican. He recently became an associate editor with the Boston Globe. Prior to that, he was senior correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter, where he worked from 1998 until this year, and has served as an analyst of Vatican affairs for CNN and NPR. Mr. Allen is also author of several books about the Catholic Church, has written two biographies of Pope Benedict XVI, 
He is also the author of The Global War on Christians, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Anti-Christian Persecution. Uh, we will then hear from um, uh, Ms. Tumina Aurora, who is an attorney with the Alliance Defending Freedom in India, a position she has held since January of 2012. Her work, focusing on protecting minority rights and religious freedom, includes litigating cases and conducting legal training. Previously, she worked as the advocacy director at the Evangelical Fellowship of India, where she managed a team of attorneys and advocates uh, who worked for the rights of Christians. We'll then hear from Mr. Benedict Rogers, in the, who is East Asian team leader at Christian Solidarity Worldwide, where he specializes in Burma, Indonesia, and North Korea. He's the author of five books and several major reports. Mr. Rogers travels widely in the region, including making more than 40 visits to Burma and its borderland, several visits to Indonesia, and a trip to North Korea. He is a regular contributor to international media, including several major newspapers and television networks. And then we'll hear from Mr. Jorge Lee Galindo, who is the director of Impulso 18, a non-governmental organization dedicated to promoting and defending liberty of belief and religion in Mexico. He has helped establish many religious organizations in Mexico and acts as the legal representative for many of them. He has given presentations at various forum uh, seminars, workshops, and roundtables, and given many interviews and radio programs on themes related to ecclesiastical law in Mexico. In addition, Mr. Galindo was president of the Latin American Network of Christian Lawyers uh, from 2006 to 2010, and currently acts as legal counsel uh, to that network. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Uh, Kutaza Gundwe, uh, who is currently team leader for Africa and the Middle East at Christian Solidarity Worldwide. She researches religious liberties issues and promotes awareness through interviews and articles in the national media and elsewhere. She has worked extensively on religious-related violence in Nigeria and the dire human rights and religious freedom situation in Eritrea, the rise of sectarian violence in Egypt, and the harassment of the house church in Iran. And without objection, each of your very distinguished resumes, uh, which uh, are almost too long to elaborate on, will be made a part of the record. And I thank you again uh, for being here and providing the subcommittee the benefits of your wisdom and counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing on what I have come to see as the premier human rights issue of the early 21st century, as well as the greatest story never told uh, about Christianity in our time. Uh, begin very quickly with an overview of the global situation. There are an estimated 2.3 billion Christians in the world today, which makes Christianity the largest single religious tradition on the planet, representing about one-third of the human population. Christianity's greatest growth in the early 21st century is occurring in Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and parts of Asia. The Christian population in Latin America has remained relatively constant, but there's been tremendous movement from the majority Catholic tradition to uh, expanding evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Despite the uh, dire decline uh, in the indigenous Arab Christian population of the Middle East, there is actually a burgeoning pocket uh, of Christianity in the Middle East in the Gulf states composed not of natives but of expats drawn to work uh, in the domestic service and oil industries. Interesting tidbit, there are 1.5 million Catholics alone in Saudi Arabia today, 1.3 million of whom are Filipinos. Uh, it's the largest Filipino diaspora uh, in, uh, in that part of the world. Bottom line is that Christianity's most dramatic growth today uh, is coming in neighborhoods that are not always distinguished by a robust respect for religious freedom, which is one factor fueling what I've described as a global war on Christians. The high-end estimate for the number of Christians killed for their faith every year today is 100,000. That's a number that comes from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Uh, there are others who would put the number lower. Uh, Thomas Schurmacher of the World Evangelical Alliance pegs the, uh, the number at 20 new martyrs per day, which adds up to about 7,300 a year. American scholar Rodney Stark goes lower still. He thinks the number is a few hundred per year. Of course, all this hinges on how you define uh, religious persecution. 
Bottom line, however, is that the high-end estimate would put the number of Christians killed for their faith every year at one per hour. The low-end estimate puts it at one per day. Wherever the truth lies, this is a global scourge um, that commands our attention. And there are other indices. The Pew Forum finds that Christians suffer from some, some form of harassment, either de jure or de facto, in a staggering total of 139 countries. That's two-thirds of all societies on Earth. The United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, we've already heard from Secretary Abrams, finds that Christians are the only religious tradition discriminated against in all 16 of the top 16 offenders. That's from their 2010 report. The National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism found that between 2003 and 2011, terroristic attacks on Christians around the world shot up by 139%. And the Evangelical Advocacy and Relief Organization Open Doors estimates that roughly 100 million Christians a day are, sub are subject to some form of physical coercion, arrest, torture, and so on. A few brief snapshots of what's happening. We already heard mention uh, of the uh, attack on the uh, Syriac Catholic Cathedral of Our Lady of Salvation in downtown Baghdad on October 31st, 2010. In itself, the fact the church was bombed that day is no novelty. Of the 63 Christian churches in Baghdad, 40 of them have been bombed at least once uh, since 2003. What followed was unusual. A band of uh, Islamic fundamentalist gunmen stormed the church. They shot the priest saying mass. They shot the two deacons assisting him. Uh, they left uh, more than 50 people dead. Uh, I had the opportunity to interview one of the survivors, a young Chaldean woman by the name of Fatima, who now lives in Rome and who dedicates every waking moment of her life to helping her fellow Christians get out of Iraq. She survived that day, she was singing in the choir, she survived that day by pulling bodies over her and playing dead for the agonizing four hours it took for someone to come and liberate the church. One hopes she is wrong in her prognosis that Christianity has no future in Iraq, but it is impossible to fault either the personal experience or the reasoning that has led her to that conclusion. But it would be mistaken to think that anti-Christian persecution is entirely an artifact of radical Islam. The most violent anti-Christian pogrom uh, of the early 21st century actually occurred in the northeastern Indian state of Orissa in 2008, when machete-wielding Hindu radicals uh, attacked a series of Christian targets, left as many as 500 Christians killed, uh, at least 50,000 homeless, many of them taking refuge in a nearby forest for weeks. Uh, an estimated 5,000 Christian homes, hundreds of churches and schools, and so on, were destroyed. Uh, in Burma, members of the Chin and Karen ethnic groups who were strongly Christian are considered dissidents by the regime, subject to various forms of imprisonment, torture, forced labor. Uh, their communities have actually even been targeted by uh, helicopter strikes, a Burmese uh, Air Force official. Uh, confirmed uh, in talking to foreign, the foreign press that these zones of majority Christian population are considered free fire zones, uh, and they basically have a fire on site warrant. Mr. Chairman, you've already talked about the mayhem currently being uh, unleashed uh, in Nigeria by the militant Boko Haram movement. North Korea, of course, uh, is uh, widely considered the single most dangerous place on the planet to be a Christian. Roughly a quarter of the country's 200 to 400,000 Christians are believed to be living in forced labor camps. The anti-Christian animus is so strong that people with Christian grandparents are frozen out of senior government jobs, senior positions in the military, senior levels of, of economic life, and so on. The estimate is that some 300,000 Christians in North Korea have disappeared since the armistice uh, in the 1950s. And these, by the way, are illustrative examples. This is by no means the whole story. To conclude, a brief thought about why this global war on Christians is so often wrapped in silence. Frankly, Mr. Chairman, I believe we have a problem of narrative. Uh, in the West, we are conditioned to think of Christianity as an all-powerful, all-controlling, wealthy, vastly influential social institution which makes it very difficult for ordinary Americans to get their minds around the idea that Christians can actually be the victims of persecution. Say religious persecution to most Americans, the images that come to mind are the Crusades, the Inquisition, uh, the wars of religion, and so on. Chapters of history in which Christ Christianity was, of course, the villain. This narrative is badly out of date, but it's been done little to weaken its hold on our imagination. The truth 
the demographic and practical truth is that the typical Christian in this world is not an affluent American male pulling up to church in a Lincoln Continental. The typical Christian in the early 21st century is a poor woman of color and mother of four in Botswana or a poor Dalit grandmother in Orissa. The reality is this, projections are that the share of the Christian population uh, that's living outside the West in the developing world is going to reach three quarters by the middle of this century. These Christians often carry a double or triple stigma representing not only their faith, but also often an oppressed ethnic group or a social class. And they are, perhaps this is the most fundamental fact, they are targets of convenience for anyone who is angry with the West. Uh, it is very difficult for ordinary people, obviously not impossible, but difficult to strike against an American embassy or the headquarters of the European Union. It is very easy to walk down the block and attack the Christian church that is on that corner, even though the irony is often the Christians in that society have deeper historical and cultural roots than their assailants do. The point is this. Uh, I think as a Christian, we have uh, perhaps special cause to be concerned with this rising tide of anti-Christian violence, but I think it requires no religious faith whatsoever to see this as a towering human rights concern. You did not have to be Jewish in the 60s and 70s to, to be concerned about dissident Jews in the Soviet Union. You did not have to be black in the 80s to be concerned about apartheid in South Africa. And you do not have to be Christian today to see our ability to defend Christians at risk as the key test, the canary in the coal mine, for our ability to mobilize any human rights concern at all. And to the extent, Mr. Chairman, you can change the narrative, thank you for your effort in doing so. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen, for your very comprehensive look uh, and for your leadership. Uh, Ms. Aurora. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for holding this important hearing and inviting me to testify today. India, in spite of its long tradition of religious tolerance, finds itself struggling with violence against religious minorities. While the Muslim community bears the brunt of this violence, uh, over the re recent years, the tiny Christian community, which stands at a mere 2.3% of the population, has faced increased hostility. Reports by faith-based rights agencies show that Christians suffer an average of 150 violent attacks annually, with many more going unreported. These attacks include physical and sexual assault, brutal murders, desecration of places of worship and graveyards. My written submission contains more details. With the exception of the state of Orissa in 2007 and 2008, the attacks are scattered and are primarily concentrated in, in the states where Hindu Nationalist Party, the Bharatiya Janata Party or the BJP is in power. The states of Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh have recorded the most number of attacks in the past two years. Perpetrated on the pretext of preventing forcible conversion, the attacks are often carried out by Hindu extremists who see India as a Hindu nation with a common fatherland, language, religion, and culture. This ideology leaves little space for religious minorities. The agencies involved in such attacks include the Bajrang Dal, the Dharm Sena, the Hindu Vahini, the Ram Sene, all offshoots of the umbrella Hindu nationalist group, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, or the RSS. Recent media reports suggest the involvement of members of similar groups also in terror attacks, including the bombing of trains, mosques, and churches. One cannot forget that the RSS has been banned on previous occasions for fomenting violence against religious minorities. It is deeply disconcerting to see the BJP prime ministerial candidate and present chief minister of Gujarat, Mr. Modi, openly align himself with this ideology as a member of the RSS and call himself a Hindu nationalist. Christian persecution, however, is not just about violence. It is compounded by the impunity enjoyed by the violent mobs, which is also a cause for concern. Many victims of violence complain of the lack of police action, including hostility towards Christians. The impunity was most evident in Orissa when in 2008, violent mobs killed over 75 people, mostly Christians, burnt over 5,000 homes and over 260 churches and prayer halls. Though approximately 2,500 complaints were registered of mob violence, only 828 were ever registered by the police. Pro charges were framed against the accused in only 512 cases, most of which ended in acquittals. Only nine people have ever been convicted of killing two Christians. The police also failed to record statement of key witnesses, conduct test identification parades, and collect and send forensic evidence, which resulted in acquittals for lack of evidence. According to the government's own records, only 15 appeals were filed by the state in over 180 cases in which more than 2,700 people were acquitted. 
Apart from the violence, I would also like to draw your attention to two discriminatory laws which greatly restrict the freedom of religion in India. Six Indian states have enacted laws titled Freedom of Religion Acts or Anti-Conversion Laws as they are more commonly known. These laws require the person converting to give details of his or her conversion to the district administrative head, either prior to the conversion ceremony or subsequent to it. The law in Gujarat requires you to, uh, to take prior permission before a conversion. The laws penalize any failure to report a religious conversion with jail terms up to one year and fines. The laws also penalize conversion by force, fraud or inducement or allurement with jail terms up to five years or fines up to $1,500. Repeatedly, these vague laws have been used to target and harass Christians. Hindu extremists have frequently invoked the anti-conversion laws to incite mob violence and having Christians arrested without evidence. The acts are vague and do not carry the required checks and balances to ensure protection against their misuse. They violate the freedom of association and conscience and the right to privacy. They make every religious conversion suspect and liable for scrutiny and remove the agency of the convertee, allowing the state to determine if the conversion is valid or not. In September 2012, the High Court of Himachal Pradesh uh, re re repealed or uh, Sorry, uh, in September 2012, the High Court of Himachal Pradesh uh, declared a section of the Himachal Pradesh law as unconstitutional, and uh, which required a person to give a 30-day prior notice to the district administration. The court held that the procedure was violative of the Indian constitution. However, similar uh, provisions remain in other state laws. The second law I would like to talk about is the 1950 Presidential Order, which states that no person who professes a religion different from the Hindu, Sikh, or Buddhist religion shall be deemed to be a member of the scheduled caste. As you may know that due to the oppressive caste system in India, there are policies and laws that allow affirmative action, excuse me, and special protection for the Dalit or scheduled caste communities. However, Dalits who accept Christianity are denied protections and benefits available <coughs> excuse me, available to other Hindu, Sikh or Buddhist Dalits, merely on account of their religious beliefs. This is despite the fact that uh, the disadvantages and discriminations faced by Dalit Christians are well documented by several agencies, including those of the government. A petition is pending before the Supreme Court of India since 2004, but the government hasn't filed its reply till date. In closing, I would like to make a few recommendations. I would urge you to support the resolution for protecting religious freedom in India. I would uh, urge you to follow up on the recommendation of the government of the United States to the government of India to ensure that laws are fully and consistently enforced to provide adequate protection for members of religious minorities in the recent uh, Universal Periodic Review. I would urge you to send uh, delegations to meet with victims of violence and visit sites of communal violence uh, this has been hugely helpful, especially in this case of Orissa, to see whether the recommendations are being met and to better understand the complexities of the issues involved, to use appropriate forms of dialogue to raise concerns about the status of religious minorities and the impunity enjoyed by Hindutva forces, and con continue to find ways to fund civil society efforts to combat human rights abuses and promote uh, religious tolerance. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Aurora, thank you very much for your testimony. That objection, your full statement, which was very heavily documented and footnoted, will be made a part of the record, and all, all of your full statements uh, as well. But thank you so much yeah, for you. this. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Chairman, uh, distinguished members, may I first of all thank you very much indeed uh, for holding this uh, hearing on this critically important subject, for giving me the opportunity to testify. And may I also pay tribute to your many years of leadership and activism uh, on uh, this and other human rights issues. In the limited time available today, I intend to concentrate my remarks on just uh, two areas of focus, Indonesia and Burma, uh, but I have provided uh, written testimony on Vietnam uh, and Laos as well. Uh, and I'd like to just uh, begin by echoing very strongly your remarks uh, made at the beginning uh, by saying that uh, in Christian solidarity worldwide, we work very much for freedom of religion or belief for all, freedom of religion is indivisible and is a basic right to, to which all people of all beliefs uh, in, in every country are entitled. Uh, and in that context, uh, whilst I talk about Indonesia and Burma, it's important to note that other religious groups face severe persecution, particularly the Ahmadiyya and Shia Muslims in Indonesia and the Rohingyas and other Muslims in Burma. Nevertheless, I would absolutely agree 
that Christianity is the most widely persecuted religion in the world today, facing threats from a wide range of sources in almost every corner of the globe. And so I turn now to two parts of the globe, starting with Indonesia, the world's largest uh, Muslim majority nation, a nation that has made a remarkable transition from authoritarianism to democracy, a nation that has a tremendous tradition of religious pluralism, harmony, and freedom. And yet that tradition of religious pluralism in Indonesia is increasingly under threat. Uh, two weeks today, uh, CSW will launch in London uh, a major new report, and I just hold it up. Uh, I believe it has been sent to your office this morning uh, because it has just gone to print today. Uh, Indonesia pluralism in peril, uh, the rise of religious intolerance across the archipelago. For Christians in Indonesia, there are two major threats, regulatory restrictions and vigilante intimidation and violence. According to the communion of churches in Indonesia, at least 430 churches have been attacked, closed down, or burnt down since 2004. According to the Jakarta Christian Communication Forum, the number of attacks against Christian churches reached a total of 75 in 2012, which marks a steady rise from 10 in 2009 to 47 in 2010 and 64 in 2011. The situation is most severe in Aceh, where in May 2012, 17 churches were closed down. Christians in Aceh live in fear and worship in secret. However, the persecution of Christians in Indonesia is by no means confined to Aceh. In West Java, for example, there have been several cases where churches which are uh, legally licensed have been forced by local mayors to close. And in at least two cases, those churches have challenged the mayor's ruling to close them in the courts. In both those cases, the courts have ruled uh, in favor of the churches, including uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, and yet the mayor refuses uh, still to permit the churches to close in defiance of the Indonesian Supreme Court. Uh, I've visited both those churches. I've stood with congregations outside their locked church building as they attempted to hold a Sunday service in the street outside because they were not permitted to use their building. And in both uh, instances, we were surrounded by a mob of angry Islamists shouting things like, Christians get out, kill the Christians. The pastor of one of those churches, the Reverend Pelti Panjaitan, whom I've interviewed four times, has received death threats, false criminal charges, and constant abuse. Last year, I interviewed Pastor Bernard Malkar of a Pentecostal church in West Java. His church has been attacked several times. On one occasion, a mob climbed over the gate during a Sunday service, and he told me, and I quote, they pulled me by my tie, taking me to the gate. They took other church members, pulling them by their clothes. They were shouting, go out, reverend, we will kill you. Our church members ran away. Some of them were teenagers and children, and they were traumatized by the experience. On the 27th of January, 2013, his church was attacked again, and he was beaten. Two days later, Pastor Bernard, not his attackers, was sentenced to three months in prison for running an unregistered church. This year, Indonesia will hold both parliamentary and presidential elections. I, I have more detailed recommendations in my written submission, but the key recommendation I would highlight uh, is that it's essential that these concerns are raised with all the Indonesian presidential candidates uh, and that the new president, uh, once he's elected, is encouraged by the international community to address these concerns. I turn now to Burma. In many respects, in the past two years, there have been some extraordinary changes in Burma, and I wholeheartedly welcome the progress. However, there is still a very long way to go, and in relation to freedom of religion, there have been serious setbacks, with a severe and dramatic rise in anti-Muslim hatred and violence, which I've been involved in trying to address. Christians have not so far been widely targeted by this rise in what I can only describe as militant Burman Buddhist nationalism, although there are reasonable concerns that that movement currently focused on the Muslim community could uh, affect Christians in the future. But on the whole, uh, whilst Christians have not been targeted by Buddhists in society, decades of discrimination by successive military regimes have left a legacy of policies of discrimination uh, which continue. In 2007, CSW published a report uh, called Carrying the Cross, 
uh, the military regime's campaign of restriction, discrimination, and persecution against Christians in Burma. And although that report is now seven years old, uh, much of the evidence uh, is still valid today. More recently, the Chin Human Rights Organization, with whom we work very closely, has published two excellent reports. Both CSW and CHRO have documented serious violations of freedom of religion affecting Christians in Burma, notably the destruction of crosses in ethnic Chin and Kachin states, and the military's role in forcing Chin Christians to build Buddhist pagodas in place of crosses. There's also been cases of forcible and coerced conversion of Chin Christians to Buddhism, often through the provision of education in military-run schools uh, and discrimination in public service. As I draw to a close, I just want to share one story. In March 2013, I visited Kachin State in northern Burma and documented attacks on Kachin Christians. I interviewed the, the wife of one Kachin political prisoner who had visited her husband just a month after his arrest in 2012, and she told me this, and I quote, when I visited my husband, he was covered in blood, his nose was broken, an iron bar had been rubbed along his legs. He was forced, and I emphasize forced, against his will in prison to engage in homosexual sex with other male prisoners. He was told that as he was a Christian, he should kneel on very sharp stones with his arms outstretched like Christ on the cross. Uh, and then other prisoners were forced to dance a traditional Kachin dance around him. He was beaten on his hands and arms, and they were hit in the head with guns. Mr. Chairman, we urge the United States to encourage the government of Burma to end policies of discrimination along religious lines and to issue an invitation to the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, to travel to Burma to visit all parts of the country uh, to investigate these violations. The persecution of Christians in the Middle East has drawn particular attention in recent months, and very understandably so. But while the persecution of, Middle East, of Christians in the Middle East is perhaps the most acute form of persecution, it is important to remember that the persecution of Christians is indeed a worldwide phenomenon today. In Southeast Asia, as I have tried to outline, Christians in Indonesia and Burma, but also in countries like Vietnam, Laos, and Malaysia, which I have not had time to speak about, continue to face discrimination, restrictions, and persecution, which amount to serious violations and which require international attention. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for your testimony. Mr. Glendo. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, Latin America is often overlooked in discussions of international religious freedom, yet serious violations of religious freedom regularly take place in the region, most notably in my own country, Mexico, but also in countries like Cuba and Colombia. In Mexico, the most severe violations of religious freedom take place in regions under the jurisdiction of traditional indigenous law referred to as uses and customs which takes precedence over civil law. Religious intolerance is most prevalent in the southwest of Mexico. Individuals who wish to practice a religion that is not of the majority are persecuted by those who disagree with their choice to change their religion and beliefs. These authorities believe that their culture is being damaged and they do, they do not accept that the freedom of the, the individual can take precedence over their traditions. Violence is frequently used against the victims, and in some cases, this has escalated to murder. Unfortunately, the government almost never chooses to prosecute those responsible for these criminal acts, and a culture of impunity in regard to violations of religious freedom becomes further entrenched. There have been attempts in Mexico to address this problem through the law. However, the conflicts continue. One of the reasons, in my point of view, is that no government up until the present day has taken the matter as seriously as it merits. The situation ex is exemplified in the case of the forcibly displaced community of Los Llanos in late April 2009. A traditional move attacked the Protestant church in, Tots in that Tzotzil village during a prayer service beating the pastor. One month later, the same church was attacked again and completely destroyed. 
In September of the same year, local authorities sent a letter to the governor of Chiapas State explicitly declaring that they had given the Protestant a deadline to leave the village and if they did not do so, they would use force to expel them. In January 2010, the local authorities informed the Protestants that they, are, they were no longer permitted to attend village assemblies and, they, and that they were prohibited from cultivating their crops. Finally, 13 homes belonging to the members of the Protestant church were completely destroyed, leaving 31 people homeless and finally forcibly displacing the community. The group filed a complaint with the National Human Rights Commission, CNDH, in late January 2010. In, the, in its conclusions and recommendations in November 30 uh, of the same year, found that the fundamental rights of the Protestants had been violated by the local and state authorities in Chiapas and recommended that they be allowed to, do, to return to their homes afford protection by the government and that their right to their religious freedom be upheld. In April 211, the CNADH visited San Cristobal de las Casas to follow up the progress of the implementation of the recommendations. No action had been taken by the state or federal authorities. In June 2013, in the face of government inaction, the group of 31 attempted to return to their homes, accompanied by supporters and journalists. One mile outside of Los Llanos, they were surrounded by traditionalists who proceeded to stone them. Two pastors were taken hostage and separated from their larger group by the traditionalists. Two, uh, the two were tied up, stripped of their clothing, beaten, and had gasoline poured on them. They were forced to walk one mile with their hands and feet shackled to the village center of Los Llanos, where the traditionalists threatened to burn them alive. The entire group was held out until state, state officials arrived and freed the group. They negotiated an agreement in which the local authorities agreed not to beat or mistreat the prisoners or to force them to pay a fee for their liberation, and the, protest and the Protestants agreed not to press charges. Of course, as in so many other cases, no charges were filled, no one was, was persecuted, and the community remains displaced. This case may, may seem extreme, but it's, it is unfortunately typical both in terms of the level of the intolerance and violence and the state and federal government's failure to respond in any meaningful way to protect the rights of the victims and to uphold the rule of law. Of law. If I may, I will not address another serious and growing threat to religious freedom in Mexico today, the rise of narco-criminal groups. Extortion aimed at houses of worship has become normal in the north of our country. Criminal groups see churches as attractive targets for money laundering. Pastors and priests who refuse to cooperate with criminal activities are threatened and kidnapped, in some cases in the middle of religious services. In December of 200, uh, 2013, two priests in the state of Veracruz were murdered, and in the state of Tamaulipas, three priests were forcibly disappeared. A fourth was beaten to death and a fifth was attacked with a baseball bat and admitted to the hospital in critical condition. In addition, many of the criminal groups have adopted a kind of pseudo-religiosity. -religi Some adhere to the cult of Santa Muerte or Saint Death. Others, like the Knights Templar in Michoacán, have cultivated their own kind of theology, mandating that all places of worship in village they control must place a bust of their leader, El Chayo, inside the temples to be venerated and worshiped. There are several penalties for refusing. One of those priests murdered in December is believed to have been targeted because he refused to bow to an Arcos group demand to hold a mass dedicated to signed death. I'm aware of at least one Catholic parish in the state of Michoacan, which has been effectively shut down because the Knights Templar have vowed to kill any priest the Catholic Church sends there. This concludes my presentations. I'm grateful for the opportunity to address you all to highlight the serious threats to religious freedom in my country and it, the larger region in Latin America. 
and I sincerely hope this will begin a discussion that will lead to protection of religious freedom for all in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Galindo. Uh, Ms. or Dr. Gondway. Thank you, Chairman Smith and uh, distinguished members for the opportunity to speak at this very important hearing. Uh, we believe in miracles, so miraculously I will give a rundown on Africa in five minutes. Broadly speaking, the majority of Christians in sub-Saharan Africa experience hostility, harassment, repression, restrictions, or violence from two main sources. Firstly, from militant Islamist ideology and resulting insurgencies that have taken advantage of pre-existing local issues, weak application of the rule of law, or power vacuums occasioned by the chronic failure of state structures. The Nigerian terrorist group Boko Haram and its offshoot Ansaru perhaps provide the clearest examples of this trend today. From its inception in 2002, Boko Haram made it clear that Christians and symbols of the federal system were its primary targets. It was also made clear that the group's aim were to be accomplished by violence. During Boko Haram's abortive uprisings during 2003 and 2004, violence was directed at Christian and federal targets in Yobe State. Following the destruction of his Medjugorje headquarters and extrajudicial killing of its leader in 2009, the group went underground, re-emerging to launch attacks that indicated a degree of specialist training. Purported spokesmen for the group have since stated that it is various, variously affiliated with other Islamist groups in Africa, such as Al-Shabaab and AQIM. As the increasingly religious dimension to Boko Haram's actions became clearer, and the group itself articulated its aims of religious cleansing, or in the case of Ansaru, the creation of a caliphate, this became evident to all. However, realization of the extent of this campaign of cleansing is currently being, to some extent, obscured by the oft-repeated phrase that more Muslims than Christians have died in Boko, at Boko Haram's hands. This ignores a dramatic rise in religious cleansing, particularly in Borno State last year. During 2013, over 46 villages were destroyed. Around 14,000 Christian villages were displaced in the Gaza area of Borno State, close to the Cameroonian border. And an unknown number of Christians were murdered with women and girls kidnapped and forced into sexual slavery. Hostages taken by Boko Haram and Ansaru in Nigeria are often held in neighboring Cameroon. This cross-border element underlines the transnational nature of Boko Haram and Ansaru and their ties with jihadi movements on the continent. One of the leaders of Ansaru is said to be a Cameroonian national. Nigerians potentially from Boko Haram or Ansaru were reportedly cited in northern Mali where Al-Qaeda affiliate, affiliated um, is Islamist groups sought to take advantage of a political vacuum and pre-existing tensions between the political center and marginalized or underdeveloped periphery. Even more recently, according to a senior UN staff member, Boko Haram has already created some kind of presence in the Central African Republic, where similar chronic and pre-existing power vacuums have been exploited to transform what was essentially a struggle for resources and political power into an increasingly religious one, raising very well real fears of the partitioning of the country along religious lines. Pre-existing issues facilitated the rise of religious extremism in northern Nigeria also. Temporarily obscured by the current terrorism is the long-term comprehensive and systematic marginalization of non-Muslim communities, which has been facilitated tacitly or deliberately by successive state governments and non-state actors over decades. And this has always been undergirded by violence. There are areas where religion is the determining factor in all sectors. Access to education, employment, opportunities, graveyards, land for houses of worship, social amenities, and even vaccination initiatives are predicated on belonging to the right or appropriate religion. And the religion of the ruling community has become the de facto state, state religion. This underlying and systematic marginalization 
which predates the ending of military rule, will need to be addressed whenever the Boko Haram crisis comes to an end in order to ensure such groups no longer enjoy conditions in which they can flourish. These violations have occurred despite the fact that Nigeria's constitution contains provisions promoting freedom of religion and forbidding discrimination against any citizen. Events in Tanzania appear to be mirroring those in Nigeria. Societal discrimination based on religious affiliation is increasingly reported from predominantly Muslim areas and in the semi-autonomous Zanzibar archipelago, which is 98% Muslim. Uamsho, or Awakening, a separatist religious movement founded in 2001, has benefited from local dissatisfaction with the terms of political union and is alleged to be behind an increase in violence targeting local Christians and particularly pastors. And an extreme interpretation of the religion of the majority community has taken precedence over civil law and constitutional provisions for religious freedom. On the Tanzanian mainland, where Christians and followers of traditional beliefs are thought to constitute a majority, there are also reports of increasing discrimination, of a rise in religion-related violence, and of a lack of justice in the aftermath of such violence. There are, as well, there is the looming threat of international terrorism here. The arrests in early October 2013 of 11 Al-Shabaab suspects allegedly undergoing military training in Tanzania's Mtwara region provided a fresh indication of the group's determination to advance its influence and aims by exploiting local grievances. According to veteran journalists, and I, and I quote him here, Al-Shabaab and Al-Qaeda are now using Zanzibar as a stepping stone. Their target is the whole country of Tanzania and the African continent at large. This is the biggest threat ever. Training on our land proves that they are here. Turning to the second trend, Christians in Sub-Saharan Africa experience hostility, harassment, repression, and even violence due to authoritarian regimes where political considerations or the governing religious ideology mitigate against all pluralism. As a former Marxist liberation movement, the Eritrean regime has, has a long-held ideological antipathy towards religion of any sort, appearing to have deemed religious adherence as a competing and dangerous allegiance and a source of national division. 2002 saw the harsh enactment of a law, a 1995 law, with the Ministry of Information issuing a decree obliging all religious groups to register or cease all activities. The decree also obliged all groups except um, Orthodox Catholics, the Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, and Lutheran Church, and followers of Sunni Islam to officially register and function under the surveillance of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. None of those who have, have met these requirements have received registration to, to date. The 2002 degree marked the acceleration of open repression with the initiation of a campaign of arrests, particularly targeting evangelical or charismatic Pentecostal Christians. And this has continued till today with varying degrees of intensity. The repression was accompanied by inflammatory statements from officials with um, religious believers equated with Islamist extremists and vilified as non-indigenous, unpatriotic agents of foreign interests who were seeking to undermine public morality and divide and destabilize the country. Between 2,000 and 3,000 Christians are thought to be detained indefinitely in Eritrea without charge or trial and, and pending a denial of faith. Torture is rife in these detention centers with prisoners being held in such inhumane conditions as metal shipping containers, underground cells, and in the open air in desert areas surrounded by barbed wire or thorns. Authorized denominations also suffer repression, most significantly in a series of government-initiated punitive measures from 2005 to 2006, the legitimate patriarch of the Orthodox Church, who had resisted government interference in church affairs, was forced from office and placed under house arrest where he remains to date. His supporters were jailed or conscripted, and we're talking about priests. Similar pressures regarding conscription 
were also exerted on the Roman Catholic Church. In Sudan, the religion of the majority, as interpreted by the current regime, is treated preferentially. Following the secession of South Sudan, religious freedom violations increased. The state made assessments of churches and then claimed and demolished places of worship after April 2012. In addition, northern-based church leaders began to receive threats and at least two instances experienced direct attacks. Between December 2012 and April 2013, we noted an increase in harassments, arrests, and detentions of Christians. Foreign Christians were deported at short notice and their property confiscated by the state. I'd just like to conclude with um, two very um, broad recommendations. The first one, is with regard to the Islamist uprisings and, and insurgencies. To echo what was said by the first speaker, early warning signs must be heated, and when intolerance manifests itself, action should be taken decisively. In the case of Nigeria, academic debate delayed action unnecessarily. In the case of the Central African Republic, a slowness in sending adequate troops to enforce security is going to cause, allow problems to fester and get even worse than they are. Once a decision has been taken to act, action must be decisive. And secondly, in the, in the case of Eritrea, voices in the US have been speaking of normalizing relations with this country. We're all for normalization. However, integrated into any discussions should be, as a primary benchmark, access to long-term political and religious detainees for the Red Cross and for the families of these detainees and also for any other relevant body. Thank you. Dr. Gundway, thank you very much. Uh, you did pack a lot in and I, as did all of you. This is, um, you know, as um, Mr. Allen said, there is a global war on Christians and your testimonies and that of our previous witnesses have made absolutely clear and I do hope members of the press and, and especially policymakers in, in free countries, realize uh, that this is, uh, this is surging in a way that is unprecedented, I think, in human history. So, and your testimonies with great detail uh, and accuracy have laid out what is happening, and I, I'm so deeply appreciative. Uh, we do, uh, would you like to, let me yield to you. Uh, I'm, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy. I've, I've got to run to another meeting, but I wanted just to say a thank you to each one of you for your, not only your testimony, but the detailed nature of that testimony and assure you that what we will do, uh, we have a staff member that is committed to this particular issue. As the chairman knows, that it is, uh, it's an honor to serve with him and fight for this particular cause, and we'll be going through your written testimony in detail, uh, and perhaps we'll be following up with you with some questions and some plans of action, but I wanted to thank you for the sacrifice of time and, and certainly the well thought out testimony. Uh, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so very much. Um, I, would, I know, Mr. Allen, you do have to leave, and I uh, just want to ask you one question, although I have many. Um, you make a very disturbing point about how ordinary people in the West uh, are conditioned to see Christianity as an agent of repression and not a victim. Um, as has been pointed out here, and you've said it as well, um, you know, very often the real face of Christianity is an African woman with four children, or as I think you also said, a Dalit. Um, you know, the, the false sense of, of somebody in a limo is just not, you know, that may be on some of the TV shows, and, uh, but it is, it is not the everyday experience. And that would include here as well. Um, what do you think accounts for such negative conditioning uh, and is any of that because the church, as a teacher, as an exhorter, as an admonisher, does play the role of spiritual teacher and guide, you know, and people rebel against that? Or is it just this false sense? You know, this may not fit as, a, as an analogy, but I'll never forget my first trip to the Soviet Union in 1982 on behalf of Soviet Jews and Pentecostals. Uh, the number of people, uh, and we heard this throughout the 1980s especially, who thought that Dallas 
was somehow America. Everyone had, I mean, it wasn't yet there. They weren't showing American movies or sitcoms or anything else yet, but that was creeping into the population. And they all thought we were, you know, the streets were paved with gold in the United States. I think, of course, could be further from the truth. Uh, what accounts for that? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think it's a complex situation, but I, I will speak now as a media professional. One thing I have learned from more than 20 years in the media business, narratives do not have to be accurate to be shockingly durable. Uh, I mean, once something is sort of cemented in the popular consciousness, and that can happen very quickly, it can take a much longer period of time uh, to move it out. Uh, and I, I think the practical reality is, it, it, first of all, perceptions tend to be framed by local reality. So, you know, Americans look around at what is visible about Christianity in their own backyard. And there are often fairly expensive-looking Catholic cathedrals or, you know, lavish Pentecostal megachurches, and they sort of draw the conclusion that Christianity Incorporated is a multinational with some pretty deep pockets. Uh, I think part of the reality, too, is that Christianity is associated with some controversial stands on the wars of culture in the West, uh, which shapes some uh, elements of our culture to have a sort of negative uh, predisposition. But however you explain it, I mean, these, amounts, these amount to explanations and not excuses. I mean, I, again, I insist that the practical reality of the early 21st century is that two-thirds of the Christians on this planet live outside the West. More than 50% of them live in poverty. That share is going to be three-quarters by mid-century. That's the reality of who Christians are on the ground today. Uh, and many of them live in dramatically at-risk situations, of, as we have heard chronicled by this panel. So however you explain the inadequate narrative that we have, uh, there's no way of justifying it. It's time for that narrative to, to be punctured uh, and be replaced with a more accurate impression of who Christians are and the risks they face. And again, on behalf of all of us, I thank you for your efforts to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. And thank you. I know you do have to leave, but we appreciate it. Let me ask of, uh, some questions of our other distinguished panelists, if I could. Um, Mr. Rogers, you pointed out that Christians in Aceh live in fear, people worship in secret. Uh, one church leader told CSW, uh, we do have a comprehensive partnership here in this country between the State Department uh, and the leadership of Indonesia. And I'm wondering if you have any sense that there is a, a component, a robust component of human rights and religious freedom as a part of that. Uh, parenthetically, I actually visited Banda Aceh after the tsunami, and I can tell you, had it not been for the sailors aboard the um, Abraham Lincoln and the helicopters that they dubbed the Grey Angels, many Muslims and Christians alike would have died uh, because they were the tourniquet on what was a very, very serious situation of hunger and, and sickness uh, as a result of the tsunami. Uh, all of that goodwill gleaned from that. Uh, are the Indonesians listening to us, or are they moving in the wrong direction? And what about that comprehensive partnership? Is it working? Thank you very much. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, I always try to emphasize talking about the situation in, in Indonesia is that Indonesia does have this great tradition of religious pluralism. Its uh, constitution, its founding state ideology, uh, known as Pancasila, uh, is uh, is a pluralistic ideology. It, it gives uh, protection for uh, the six recognized religions uh, in in Indonesia, uh, and and that's a tremendous uh, credit to the the world's largest Mus Muslim majority nation. Uh, and so when I'm talking to uh, people in Indonesia and in the Indonesian government, I try to frame the argument very much in, in terms of their own achievements and their own tradition being in peril. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, they've made this great transition from the Suharto era dictatorship to a thriving democracy that I think too is in peril by these violations of religious freedom and also violations of the rule of law. When I gave the example of the two churches where the Supreme Court had upheld their right to exist and the local mayor was defying the Supreme Court and nobody has taken action to ensure that the Supreme Court's rulings are, are implemented, uh, the churches remain locked uh, and the mayor is free to defy the, the court. Uh, so it then becomes rule of law issues. But if I may just add uh, a third point, uh, I think that uh, there is a, a, a myth uh, out there in, uh, in, in the world uh, about the current Indonesian government uh, led by President Susilio Bangbang Yudhoyono. He is often seen as a, a force of moderation. 
and the government of Indonesia is seen as uh, being largely sympathetic to our concerns, but being weak and, and unable to uh, take action. Uh, and my research in this report that uh, uh, we're about to publish uh, shows that, that that is completely untrue. Uh, I, I have to conclude very sadly that President Yudhoyono is neither a force nor uh, particularly moderate. Uh, when you look at his 10-year presidency, he has introduced the most sectarian and, and discriminatory legislation of any Indonesian president. Um, he's introduced legislation that ha has had a direct impact uh, on churches as well as on uh, other uh, communities. Uh, he's actually made himself very inflammatory remarks, uh, particularly in a speech to the Council of Indonesian Ulama, where he basically gave them a green light to, uh, to issue um, discriminatory uh, fatwas, re religious rulings. Uh, and some of his own ministers have made very inflammatory remarks. So I think we're actually dealing with a government that is more complicit with this than perhaps uh, we like to admit or they like to admit. Uh, and, and my hope in this close relationship that the United States has with Indonesia, particularly looking ahead to Indonesia's presidential elections this year when the current president will leave office, I hope the United States will really put pressure on the incoming president to tackle these issues. Let me ask you about Burma. You really had very specific information uh, about the repression against Christians. And frankly, there's a, you know, very often one major step forward in one area is seen as, well, everything's fine there. Let's move on, look elsewhere. And when Aung San Suu Kyi came here and spoke, she was eloquent as she always has been uh, and very brave. Um, and of course, um, absolutely deserved the Nobel Peace Prize. But for a lot of Americans and policymakers, it's like Bur Burma is off the list of anything that we need to be looking at. And yet you give some very compelling insights as to ongoing repression against Christians. Could you elaborate? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think, uh, of course, there have been some tremendous uh, openings in Burma. I've uh, experienced them myself. Uh, it's possible to do things in Burma that would have been inconceivable uh, just a couple of years ago. I, I was in Burma most recently in October, November, uh, and I was able to give uh, trainings and workshops in human rights and religious freedom that just would have been impossible a short time ago. So those positive steps are welcome, but you're absolutely right. Uh, there is this tendency to think that just because Aung San Suu Kyi is released and is now sits in, in parliament, uh, and, and because many political prisoners have been released, uh, that our job is done and, and, and Burma is a normal country. Uh, I, I, my conclusion on Burma is, if I may, just two Please. brief points. Firstly, I think there has been a change of atmosphere, but not yet a change of system. Uh, so there has been a, a, a relaxation uh, in some respects and, and an increase in freedom of, in, in space for, for civil society, to some degree freedom of expression. But at the same time, uh, an increase in religious intolerance directed both uh, most starkly actually against the Muslim community in, in Burma, but, but also uh, this long legacy that I described uh, of violence against and persecution of, of Christians. Um, uh, and and I, I wrote a piece recently in the Wall Street Journal where my concluding line was, the beginning of the beginning may have just begun. And by that I mean, Yes, there are some positive changes, but there's a very, very long way to go, and we must not think that by any means that our job is done, as the evidence I've given today shows. Ms. Aurora, you, again, spent a great deal of time um, delineating the problems in India, and you also talked about the anti-conversion laws. Could you tell us what accounts for the Gujarat's extreme law, and what is the role of the BJP and what happens? What are the consequences potentially in terms of religious liberty if BJP wins the upcoming elections in May? Well, the, the Gujarat law to start with was enacted by a BJP government. Uh, Mr. Narendra Modi as chief minister enacted that law. Um, it is perhaps the most severe Could you law. come closer, please? Uh, it is perhaps the most severe law uh, of all the anti-conversion laws and actually requires permission to be sought before any religious conversion. An inquiry will be conducted into every religious conversion and there is um, high penalties levied if uh, that procedure is not followed. Uh, the law itself is very vague and uh, allows for Christians uh, and Muslims, in fact, uh, to be targeted under this. There have been several instances of Christians and Muslims being uh, prosecuted under the law. Thankfully, there have been no convictions as of date. 
Uh, the BJP has called for a national anti-conversion law, so we see that uh, as the most immediate um, something coming through if they were to come to power. And we have also seen uh, the impunity that is enjoyed by the Hindutva forces, as I outlined in my testimony, uh, in Odisha. But we have seen that across the states, in the state of Karnataka, in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, I have spoken to police officials on several occasions who have informed me uh, well, you know, the pastor was converting. I mean, even conversion has become uh, an issue, uh, let alone conversion by force, fraud, or inducement. And we see that uh, rising as the BJP comes to power. Uh, already there is a sense of euphoria uh, among the ranks, um, almost agree that they will be coming to power. So, yes, that is something that, as minorities, that is deeply feared. Is the United States doing enough to raise these issues? For example, our ambassador to India, uh, the State Department, in your view? I think more can be done. Um, India is very receptive to um, agencies, uh, organizations, governments speaking to us. I think uh, more can be done. Um, I think some has been done, especially when you look at Orissa. Uh, there has been some focus that was put on, on the state of Orissa. But across the country, there just needs um, consistent dialogue with the Indian government on these issues. So I would urge the government of the U.S. to do that. Thank you. Ms. Gundway, uh, Dr. Gundway, you, you um, again, you've touched on country after country with great detail. Um, one of the narratives here is that somehow al-Shabaab is on the wane, especially since um, they have not fared as well as they would have hoped in Somalia. But then they struck, they, you know, they struck, strike very hard in Nairobi, and that was one wake-up call. And you go on. Uh, to talk about you know the target of Al Shabaab and Al Qaeda uh, using Zanzibar as a stepping stone, their target is the whole country of Tanzania. And I think a lot of people forget that when Nairobi got hit in 1998, so did Dar es Salaam. And I actually chaired the hearings when Admiral Crow, who headed up the Accountability Review Boards, uh, talked about how we didn't think they could hit there. Um, you know that was not one of the targets that we thought uh, extremist Muslims would would focus on, um, and as a matter of fact, I actually wrote the Embassy Security Act to further protect at least U.S. interests there with dip more diplomatic security. But the point being, um, I think we, we are naive to some extent, thinking that somehow there's a decline or they're on the wane uh, when, we give, when you come forward with evidence about uh, just how they are multiplying and growing more lethal and dangerous every day. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um from the research I have done, it shows that uh, Al-Shabaab has actually actively gone forward to recruit nationals from you know, the different countries, um, particularly along the coast and also inland. Um, quite a few of the people who've been arrested in Kenya recently are actually, actually Kenyan nationals not necessarily Somali killing nationals, you know, Somali ethnicity. And the same thing has been happening also in Tanzania and elsewhere. I think uh, it's very easy to say they're on the wane because um, military actions in Somalia itself appear to be being quite effective. And there have been a few strikes that have taken out leaders, et cetera, et cetera. However, what has not been factored into the equation is that they have been pretty effective in taking advantage of youth who feel that they have no stake in society and giving them a reason to live, so to speak, and also a religion, you know, with religion on top of it, it gives them a, some kind of raison d'etre. And uh, it's those people that people should be worried about more than any, anything else. And uh, I think, for example, in the UK, we had uh, the killing of uh, Lee Rigsby in broad daylight in London. That was a wake-up call, that there are youth, that youth there too who feel they have no stake in society and are actually being actively targeted in different ways. In the UK, um, we're hearing about targeting within the prison system. And these are the people that we should be worried about. I don't know if that's a thing that the US has been looking at, but uh, the targeting of disaffected, unemployed youths in Africa is very, a very worrying thing. While we were in uh, Tanzania, we heard anecdotal evidence of uh, people being trained and then sent back even to my country, Malawi, and other places. 
where they are sort of sleeper cells almost and are, are being prepared to move when there's a time to move. I don't have hard evidence of that, but considering what has been happening elsewhere, I wouldn't doubt what we heard. If I could ask you as well, you point out that between and testify between two to 3,000 Christians are detained indefinitely at any given time in Eritrea. Mm -hmm. uh, you point out that as with tens of thousands of other prisoners of conscience, none have been formally charged or brought to trial and all are held pending a denial of faith. Torture is rife in Eritrea's detention centers with prisoners being held in such humane conditions as metal, shipping containers, underground cells, and in the open air desert surrounded by barbed wire or thorns. And you go on uh, to further detail that mm -hmm. horrific mistreatment. My question is, um, in your view, has the American government, has the African Union, um, has the Human Rights Council uh, waged, weighed in effectively on behalf of these persecuted Christians and other prisoners of conscience in Eritrea? I would say the American government has weighed in probably the most effectively. Okay. And I commend the American government for that. Could you uh, oh, come sorry. closer, please? Thank you. Um, they have waded in possibly the most effectively, uh, and I commend the American government for that. The others have fallen in line slowly, but initially the concern about Eritrea was that it was a destabilizing influence you know, in the Horn of Africa, siding with Al-Shabaab and facilitating things for Al-Shabaab. So the initial UN sanctions against Eritrea focused on uh, security issues, forgetting that the people of Eritrea are probably its biggest victims. Uh, the Human Rights Council has now waded in far more effectively with the creation of a, of a, a special rapporteur on human rights in Eritrea. However, Eritrea refuses to engage with the special rapporteur, so that's slightly problematic, but at least Eritrea is now being challenged at international level for its treatment of, of its, its citizens. Mr. Glendo, you uh, went into great detail about the group uh, that filed the complaint with the National Human Rights Commission uh, in 2010, in, uh, people living in Chiapas. Um, the, the question is, the, uh, from what I gleaned from your statement here, is that the local police, local governing authority were in solidarity with the traditionalists and were part of the problem. Did the federal government uh, send in federal troops, federal police, uh, to intervene, and, and under the new presidency of, uh, of um, Mexico, has there been any change, any focus on trying to ensure a robust religious freedom there? Yes. Um, let me answer it this way. As I told in my speech, no government up until the present day has taken the matter as seriously as it. So the present day has taken yeah. it seriously? I think the old president, not, not in this administration, before also, they only said uh, in their campaigns about this issue, but in, in, the, in the practice, we do not have any, any support of, of, of this important theme. Uh, let, me, let me explain you in this way. In 1992, our constitution was modified. 1992. It was the first time after 70 years that the churches were going to be recognized. I mean, 70 years, no churches in Mexico. 1992, they said, okay, we, we understand they are. We, are, we have to register them. The authority in that, in that uh, year thought that it was gonna, it gonna be 100 churches re registered. All. Now, almost, we have 8,000. So uh, if, we, if you can uh, travel in 1992, our law now is limited. I mean, it's not is not enough. Now I think that the, that the time is, is correct in this, in this uh, moment. Why? Because a uh, year, uh, few years, months ago, the international treaties and our constitution are equal. So, so just, uh, I'm, I'm speaking of uh, one year ago, the human rights are considered very, very, very important in Mexico. So we are expecting that in this administration, we can have good results. Mr. Glendo, if I could ask you, you pointed out that there's another serious and growing threat to religious freedom uh, in Mexico, and you said over the last six years, the government has attempted to confront narco-trafficking criminal networks with the full force of the law, law. And however, extortion aimed at houses of worship have become normal, 
And you pointed out that in 2011, the Catholic Bishops Conference announced more than 1,000 priests have received threats. And then you went on to talk about in 2013, two priests in the state of Veracruz were murdered. Uh, and, and you go on to talk about some of the others who have been mistreated or, or murdered. Uh, the question is two questions. One, uh, is it narco trafficking and human trafficking? That Are they doing both? Uh, and what is the government doing to try to, I mean, we have gangs here in the U.S., as you know so well, uh, and, and one of the most disturbing evolutions of those gangs is that they're not just doing drugs, they're also selling women. They have commodified women, um, and it's becoming a very serious, obviously horrible exploitation of, of young girls and women, but it makes an enormous amount of money for these gangs. Um, is, is that something that's happening in, in Mexico as well? Well, exactly, I don't know uh, in exactly the way, but uh, the thing is that we have a very, very big problem with narco-traffic uh, gangs. I mean, uh, they they are working, I don't know how, and uh, they have a lot of, of uh, strange to do the, 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 the thing that they are doing. Uh, the thing is that the churches, uh, that is my, my issue, uh, they are afraid to, to, to continue working. I mean, because of, of the of the uh, evil that they, they have, right. we have uh, the problem is in the north of the, our our republic, more than the center or south. In the north of the, of the republic, near 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 the states. I mean, Chihuahua and Sinaloa and, and all the north. So uh, what we are trying to do is uh, by the churches just to work as they used to, and uh, to pray to 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 be very intelligent. How can they? can affront that that uh, that problem but maybe i i think maybe we have those those things of uh, of uh, treat of persons you have pointed out that the cuban government yeah um, uh, very often it's a matter of indifference or lack of enforcement of law in some governments but in cuba's case it's the government yeah. uh, perhaps you might want to elaborate on that uh, because it seems, I mean, we've had several human rights hearings uh, in this subcommittee on, on Cuba, and one of the only, besides some of the political prisoners and those who have stood up so boldly, uh, the churches are one of the last remaining bulwarks against uh, tyranny by Fidel Castro. Yeah, the, the thing is that they want to control everything. Right. That's, that's the problem. They want to control everything, and religious also. So that's, that's the, 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 the big problem. Mr. Rogers, should the Congress and the President move forward with TPP um, towards Vietnam without conditionality on human rights? Uh, <clears throat> just to clarify, was that uh, the uh, trans TPC or, t or t t Yes, yes, the, uh, the tr new trade agreement that, that yes. the President is seeking fast track authority for? No, I, I certainly don't believe it should be without conditions. I think uh, the very serious human rights uh, issues and particularly religious freedom uh, affecting Christians and affecting uh, other religious communities in Vietnam should absolutely be uh, looked at by the United States uh, and, and uh, the Vietnamese government should be pressed to uh, address those concerns uh, before the agreement is, is signed. I would just point out for the record that um, in April and June, we, I chaired two hearings on Vietnam human rights with a focus on religious freedom. And, and my hope is that both parties here in the Congress will listen very carefully to what's happening on the ground in Vietnam. Before the bilateral agreement occurred, uh, there was all of this hope and expectation that religious freedom and other human rights would break out of, of their block where they've, they've, and, and there would be a change. Uh, and nothing even close to that happened. It went in the opposite direction. And, and Vietnam now has deteriorated. Uh, Block 8406, you know, the, the folks that signed that wonderful human rights charter, systematically have been arrested and hunted down. And I made a trip to Vietnam some years ago, right before the bilateral agreement, and visited dissidents in Hue, Hanoi, and Ho Chi Minh City and most of those individuals have been arrested, rearrested. Father Lee was under house arrest when I met him. Uh, he is now back in prison. Uh, it, it would be unconscionable, 
And I think it's unconscionable for the Obama administration not to be insisting on human rights conditionality with a country that has already shown that they want economic benefits sans linkage to human rights uh, conditions. Is there anything else uh, the distinguished? Uh, yes. Yes, sorry, uh, I forgot to tell, to tell you something. In this administration, in, with this president, we are, uh, hopefully, that this is going to be arranged, I mean. But uh, we are thinking, we are seeing that uh, they are afraid of our new groups, not Christian groups also, new groups. They are afraid and they are putting some uh, limits uh, not, not in the law, and they are trying to see how they can uh, limit them to, to grow. I mean, uh, that's also a problem. We are not talking also uh, only of Christians, but we, all, we are talking for new groups that uh, they are trying to, to associate, and they have a little bit of problems, like uh, Sanchology or uh, a lot of, of them, that they are trying to in, uh, get in in the law, but the, the, the government says, I, I, don't, I don't like them and I want to stay back a little bit. So that's also a problem of a religious liberty of the new groups. Thank you. I want to thank you again for your extraordinary testimony, your leadership. Uh, I want you to know that your testimonies, the hearing record will be very widely disseminated. We hope that the State Department uh, takes note and reads carefully the, uh, what you have conveyed to the subcommittee. And I would like to enter into the record a statement by Dr. Brian T. Grimm, President of the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation, entitled Persecution of Christians, Getting the Numbers Straight. Uh, hearing no objections, it is so entered. And uh, again, I thank you so very much. The hearing is adjourned.